World Clock. All right. I'd like to call the October CBA meeting to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Matt Kaiser. Present. Richard Brooks. Present. Anthony Jones. Present. Ken Vincent. Here. Keith Perkins. Ken Hilton. Present. Okay. So our first order of business will approval of minutes. For that, I'll appoint Mr. Jones as a voting member. Approval of minutes of the meeting of September 4th, 2024 and September 12th, 2024 meetings. Any, what's the wish of the board? Mr. Brooks. I'd like to make amendment to the September 12th meeting minutes on the next to the last page um, where we were discussing minutes during this discussion. I had at one point realized I was discussing minutes that had already been approved and that just didn't make it into the minutes. So I'd like to just have that put in there that upon realizing that those minutes were already approved that the point that I brought up about them was no longer valid. Well, all right. Any other discussion on the minutes? If not, we'll attend a motion to approve the minutes. Mr. Brooks. I'll make a motion to approve both sets of minutes, the one, and of course the September 12th with the amendment as discussed. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second by Mr. Jones. All those in favor of approving the minutes, raise your right hand. Mr. Vincent. Abstain. Abstain. No, abstain. Okay. Because I wasn't at the meeting. Yep. Very well. Okay, uh, item two is old business. Old business. Uh, Item alpha is RAH Summersworth CD LLC is seeking a variance from section 19.20. Charlie.3.I point 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 to allow a 100, 150 square foot flag on a property located at 192 Route 108 in the commercial industrial district, Assessor's Map 62, Lot 05, ZBA Case 13 20, 2024. Mr. Jones. I'd like to recuse myself. Very well. With that, there's a public hearing. I'd like to open the public hearing. Okay. Ms. Crosley. Yes, so um, as stated, this application was continued from the September 4th meeting to allow for the applicant to have a full five-member board um, hear their variance request. They are seeking to allow the installation of a 10 by 15, 150 square foot flag. The ordinance allows by right without own a permit a 50 square foot flag. So because they are seeking to have a larger than what is allowed flag, the variance is required. Um, as noted, um, noted in the staff memo, they have received site plan approval recently in 2022 for the new automobile sales facility and a variance in 2023 to allow for additional 24.78 square feet of freestanding sign and to allow for two freestanding signs. The applicant has addressed the five criteria questions in the application so the board can review the application and take action. Questions for Ms. Crosley. Mr. Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question is, um, uh, so do we have a date when this ordinance first took effect? I know, uh, it's, I know it's kind of a tough question here, and I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, where I'm going with this is that, uh, you know, I've been an advocate of um, uh, trying to be a little bit more, give the business district a little bit more relief especially up on route 108 because you know we, we seem to have some older um ordinances um and i understand we have to obey by them and stuff but I've, I've always been an advocate of maybe we can review this one in particular and make a change um you know flags are a big deal uh to some of the uh, businesses and you know i get it if you have a residential home right by it uh, or sandwiched in between it. I can understand maybe not in that district or zone. Um, anyway, that was my question. The sign ordinance was revised in its entirety in 2009. Thank you. And then the most recent update was in regards to the Summersworth Plaza signage. So that was the last time part of the sign ordinance was amended. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Crosley? The applicant, please come forward, state your name, and explain why we should grant this variance. Good evening. Thank you for your time tonight. My name is Greg Gilmet, and I represent Tri City Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. Got to get this up, please. Yep. 
So in reference to uh, you know, line one, in reference to how this could diminish the property values, uh, it isn't just businesses that fly the flag, residents fly the flags. And there's just no supporting documentation out there how flying our nation's flag would diminish property value. Uh, explaining uh, granting the variance would not be contrary to public interest. The flag shows our patriotism. Uh, we're proud to fly our flag. Uh, we hope that others would appreciate that as well. It's just our intent to fly it and fly it correctly. Uh, reference to the hardship, line three, hardship. We want to do it correctly. Uh, there are very specific guidelines to the size flag uh, that, you fly, that you fly on your property. Uh, with the size of the property that we have, as far as the, the land, the building, the frontage, and also the location of the flag, um, the hardship comes to flying the flag correctly and within the guidelines of representing the flag. Uh, 50 square feet doesn't give you a whole lot. Uh, I think the most common flag out there right now is 6 by 10 and it certainly exceeds 50 square feet. Um, uh, number four, granting the variance, how granting the variance would do substantial justice. Again, it's just our patriotism and we want to represent the flag and display the flag according to the guidelines and respect that how the proposal is not contrary to the spirit of the ordinance. Um, it's a flag. It's not advertisement. It's not a banner. It has nothing to do with our daily operation and what we do there. It's our nation's flag. And we just want to fly it correctly and with respect. Thank you. OK. Um, just step aside. We'll see if anybody else wants to speak either for or against it, and then we'll call you back up to answer questions. Anyone, does anybody like to come up to speak either for or against the application? They don't go too far. Nope, see it? No one? Okay, come on back up. And once you get all the way and sit down, you know. So, all right, questions for the applicant. I got a question for you. So, the, the, the picture of the property, how, f how far from the front of the property is the flagpole located? Meaning from the street? From the property little boundary or the street, which are probably similar. Yes. Um, approximately 125 feet. Okay, so it's, see, I don't have a current view. So it's 125 feet from the front of the property. Okay. Correct. From, from Route 108 to where the flag is located. Okay. And how tall is the flagpole? The flagpole itself is 50 feet. Flag pole is 50 feet. Okay. If so, would you, in your opinion, would, if if you had to fly a flag that was only 50 square feet or approximate or three by five, well, six by ten or that that size, would it be visible from the road? I mean, how visible how visible would it be from the road? Uh, it would be well. You got if you if you're going to do it correctly, then you would also get a shorter flag pole. Okay. Uh, would it still be visible? It would be, but it would also be considerably out of proportion to the size of the building. Okay. And the footprint, again, or the footprint of the uh, property. All right. Other questions for the applicant? Mr. Brooks. Do you fly any other flags on the property? I'm sorry? Do you fly any other flags of any kind? So that's the sole flag on the property. This is a single flag. We don't have any bunting, banners, anything like that. Is there anything taller than the flagpole on the property? The building. How tall is the building? Considerably taller. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so the building itself is taller than the flagpole? Considerably, yes. Okay. Um, So obviously you say that the flag represents that country. I mean, nobody would disagree with that. Would you say that it represents a government agency? No, the flag is no, it, it, would, it would not. Okay, that, I, I'll talk about that later on, but I'll let other people have questions. Further questions for the applicant? So, in, oh, I have a good question for you. So, the flag, 
one of the concerns would be in improving a flag, a, a, the larger the flag, the more noise it would, could potentially make. So let me ask you, so the, the closest residential property is behind you, correct? Yes. About how far is that? Thousand feet. Okay. Eight hundred to a thousand. And I would also I would also add that during the uh, design of the property, uh, there was considerable amount of vegetation, if you will, or bushes, trees, etc., uh, to reduce noise. Okay. Prior daily, you know, prior daily operation. Um, there was extensive design for that. All right. Mr. Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks a lot for taking my question. Uh, I, I see here on the picture here of the, um, the down view, I see that um, there is uh, definitely uh, adequate uh, uh, buffer of trees and so forth for sound reduction. Um, is that a true statement? Absolutely. Uh, there was a lot of money spent and a lot of uh, time that went into that design. And I'm only assuming that, uh, obviously, because when we do projects like this, I'm, that was a very, very expensive, uh, very nice project that was done. That building looks great. Thank you. Um, that, uh, yeah, the planning board does take this into consideration because you do have homes, which is um, is all behind the property. And I think you have, and you have a couple of businesses on each side, but the, 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 the massive size of the property um, in itself um, noise carrying flag i really don't think that uh, would apply here would you agree i would definitely agree you know between the motorcycles and the cars would greatly drown out any noise that the flag would make. thank you i would also indicate that the flag design excuse me the flag pole design uh the lanyard or the rope is inside is inside the actual tube itself so the wind doesn't catch the rope and slap it like say if you've ever heard sailboats and things like that uh, it, it doesn't do that okay. other questions for the applicant all right any final comments by the applicant god bless america <laughs> so much. okay thank you very much with that i'm going to close the public hearing Open it up to board discussion. The first order of business is whether we think there's any regional impact. Does anyone think there's a regional impact? If not, we'll entertain a motion. Mr. Brooks. I move the variance request for REH Summersworth CD LLC does not have the potential for regional impact. We have a motion to a second. Uh, and second by Mr. Perkins. Any discussion on the motion? The motion is that it does not have any regional impact. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Motion passes 5-0. Discussion on the variance. Mr. Brooks. Obviously, if we've got a 50-foot flagpole and we put a 2 by 3 foot flag up there, it would look tiny. It would look ridiculous. Obviously, they should be sized to fit the flagpole. Um, I'm kind of disappointed the flagpole isn't taller than the building. I think that would be a proper representation with it. Um, I want to read the ordinance here because it says exempt signs. The following types of signs may be erected without the review and approval of the sign review committee, provided that they comply with all other regulations in this chapter, except where specifically exempted. And then further down in section C3I, flags, emblems, and insignia of any governmental agency or religious Charitable, public, or nonprofit organization provided, provided that no single flag shall exceed 50 square feet in area and no lot shall display more than three such flags. There is no definition of a flag in this ordinance either. So I don't see that this is even under our purview. I, I think he can legally fly this flag as big as he wants from the way I understand the ordinance. So I'm not even sure he needs a variance. That's just my opinion. Mr. Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I have to agree. I don't think that uh, the ordinance in any way uh, or any form uh, had uh, any con any connection to the U.S. The United States flag. I just don't think it did. Um, <clears throat> first of all, 
Uh, and if it does, well, let's go ahead and mock this one, this ordinance, so we can go in and make some amendments to it if we can, and they can bring it to full council uh, to make some uh, changes because it's the United States flag. In my opinion, uh, I think that there, sh there could be any flag flown that's the United States flag. Now, look, I understand because I have a business up there on Route 108. I know that there are flags now that come out that catch the wind and say, you know, in my case, fireworks. I get it. And there's some businesses that don't really apply to that, but I'm not I'm not throwing stones at them. Um, so the ones that I think that the ordinance really meant was the flags that stick in the ground that are 10 feet tall that say like car dealerships or fencing or whatever it may be that you're trying to sell. I've seen several of them across properties. If you had a hundred foot, um, if you had a hundred foot frontage, I've seen in some cases like five or six of them there when you're only supposed to, I think only have two. I just, um, I just try to focus on the more important things. Uh, and I don't mean to say that that's not important. I mean to say that, yeah, if, if you are on the border of, um, a home or a residential neighborhood, then you know what? Those flags that are going, the clanging of the, um, the you know the halyards and so forth, and the buckles on the on the um, flagpole could be a nuisance at night. You know, especially during the summer when the windows are open and stuff. I just don't think this applies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Brooks. To uh, Mr. Vincent's point about the other flag style signs. When they talk about banner signs for definition, I think that's would fall under those. Right. Very different than a flag. But again, there's no definition of a flag in here either. So, right. Mr. Crosley, like to add how the how the uh, city got to where we were, we are to cause, require a variance. Um, the city felt that this did fall under for the aspect of a governmental agency. And this is where flags are regulated in our ordinance um, without any other option to allow for larger signs, any other regulation in the ordinance. We advise them to seek a variance from this provision to allow this larger than 50 square foot flag without, it wouldn't require additional sign permits or anything like that, but that this would be the course of action. Mr. Fredette. And I mean, I think it follows that there has to be some regulation and maybe the wording of the ordinance could be clearer, but I think the city is within its purview and I think, you know, that's what this board is here for is to hear these cases. I think in this situation, for the same reasons that we granted a sign variance a few months ago, the size of the lot, the size of the building, its location made it unique um, imposed a hardship. I'm assuming um, that the 50-foot flagpole was uh, on the uh, plan for the build. So, you know, a p building permit, Ms. Crosley, would have been pulled that would have had a 50-foot flagpole on it, correct? Not at this point, but they did submit a minor field modification to identify a flagpole location. Um, so it was not part of the initial site plan and the applicant did supply that as part of their application so they showed us where the pla uh, excuse me the pole would go but um, I think that's where the discussion about the size of the pole flag was discussed so it was advised that the variance would be required to allow the additional so not the initial but as part of a, an amendment to the plan that is um, normal and procedural through staff simplest method here seems to be to just grant the variance because it meets all the criteria in my opinion so if uh, someone wanted to put in a flagpole would a building permit be required is that a structure or? i think it would be considered a structure um there's a foundation to the pole from my understanding of it so likely it would require a building permit but they would confirm that with the building inspector for those requirements so the board has a choice here to make. The, voice, the board can go down the variance path, or the, bo bo the board can, re can basically make an emotion that, that basically make an administrative decision that 
it doesn't require it doesn't require a variance at all based on what the board feels the wording of the what documents are so we can go either path it's the, what the, whatever we feel is the right method method mr benson thank you mr chairman so if, if we make an administrative uh, decision then any further uh any further applicants for this type of variance don't apply then correct It's, each each case is individual, and we, we don't really want to set precedence on each individual in a case. So right. I'm, I'm not sure that that is the case. Is the case? It would certainly set set a path. That whether it would set precedence or not is a good question. That's illegal. So in that case, I'd like to make a motion, if I could. Oh, Mr. Mr. Fredet would like to have further discussion. Oh. So before, I'm not sure where you're going with this. We have yet this, to talk about all the criteria. So if, okay. if you're going for a variance, we need to make sure we talk about all the criteria. That's okay, we go, go ahead. A motion on a That's okay, thank you. All right, so is that where you're thinking of going for the variance? Yeah, I was gonna give, make a motion. All right, so, so let's, let's just briefly discuss the, the criteria for a variance to make sure we all are on the same page and we've, just, we've adequately discussed them. So the first one is uh, proposal not to diminish any sur surrounding property values. I think the primary concern there with the board was that um, if the, would it make any noise or is it you know right next to an adjacent property, um, uh, other residential property, the applicant adequately de defined that it's well away from other properties and therefore would not affect other surrounding property values. Um, Grand variance will be contrary to public interest. I think flying the American flag, is, as, as the applicant pointed out, is patriotic. Um, I don't see it as contrary to public interest. Uh, little enforcement, the hardship criteria. Uh, the applicant explained that they feel the hardship criteria was that they have such, that because their lot is such is so large that the application, the ordinance, unfairly jeopardizes them by requiring them to have a small sign. They have a large lot, so therefore they feel they should be able to, allowed to have a larger um, flag. Um, the, the, the location of the pole is such that it's if the pole did fall over, it wouldn't fall in the right of way. It is far enough back from the right of way that it wouldn't cause any issues there. Uh, explain how granting the variance would do substantial justice. Um, in other words, is there any negative to the public? I can't see that there's any negative to the public on this versus what the, the applicant would gain. Explain how the proposal is not contrary to the spirit of the ordinance. The spirit of the ordinance, I think, is to keep so that you don't. It's to try and keep big, I don't want to use the word gaudy, I'm not sure what the right, but big obnoxious signs or big flags from flying and, and, and being in a, causing a scene or disrupting traffic. I think where this is located wouldn't be that, so I think it is within sphere of the ordinance. Comment the board would like to add to that? Mr. Fredette, then Mr. Brooks. Um, yeah, and the, we've taught, we've, again, just to reiterate, we've had variances on this property before, size of the building, size of the lot. All hardships. Mr. Brooks? Just noting on the picture you've supplied with the uh, dimensions and so on, he even notes that the high school has a 10 by 15 flag, which would be out of compliance with the ordinance if that was the case. Um, of course, I think the city's exempt, oddly enough. <laughs> um, again, I just. I'm not opposed to granting a variance as long as it's specifically for an American flag, but I still believe that there's not even a variance needed here in this situation because it is specifically the American flag. Okay. Further discussion? Mr. Hilton? I hate uh, setting a standard that from now on, if anybody wants to fly an American flag, they have to come before the board to get a variance. I agree with what Mr. Brooks is saying, that, you know, uh, and I disagree with what, what Mr. Fredette said, that we have to have an ordinance. No, we don't. <laughs> if we want to fly the American flag, we don't have to have a, an ordinance. So, I mean, uh, so I, I would say that we could, uh, let's go back to live free or die. <laughs> Let's not do this. Uh, but I, I agree. You know, it, it seems it seems foolish to me that we're wasting this man's time. That we have to, he has to come before us all to get the okay to get a bigger flag. That seems that seems uh, absurd to me. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, the wonders of uh, electronics today and being able to sit here and. You know, 
see things sometimes like texts on our phone was just brought to my attention that the one the flag out here at city hall is bigger than what the ordinance is so with that being said i think we should just make a decision instead of passing and uh giving him the variance i think we should just make uh what you had said earlier what was the wording that you used administrative decision, administrative decision and just put this to bed thank you to brooks I agree with the administrative decision. We're not saying that this ordinance is moot and not to be followed anymore. The flag ordinance would still be there. We're just noting that as far as an American flag goes, this doesn't pertain to it. That's a really good point. Mr. Burdett? My only question is, are we fine with our neighbor flying a 200 square foot flag on a quarter acre lot? Absolutely. <laughs> Mr. Hilton. Agreed. So uh, if, if you want to take, if the board wishes to take that path, the board needs to specifically say where the, uh, what the staff, the city failed on in their interpretation of the ordinance. Mr. Brooks. I'll make a motion through administrative decision that we feel that the city erred in requiring a variance for specifically an American flag to be flown larger than the f sign ordinance regulates flags in the wording. I'll second that. Okay, your motion second. So the, mo the motion, in, in, if I boil it down to, is that they erred in, erred in requiring a variance for American flag. Specifically an American flag. Yeah specifically for American flag. Any comments on that, Mrs. Crosley? The motion is that, in it, okay. So that Brooks determined that the city has erred in the decision that to fly an American flag of any size requires a variance and would not, would not need, be, it would be exempt from those requirements. Exactly. I, I see nothing in the ordinance that specifically calls out an American flag as being restricted in some way. Okay. Just an additional point, uh, Mr. Chairman, that remember if, if, the, if the city doesn't like it, what's going on, they can make the changes. They, they can make the changes, too, to make this ordinance different. So thank you. And, and just to throw in a little more here, if, if somebody had a military flag or any of these other agencies that are part of the government, those are restricted by our ordinance. It's just specifically the national United States American flag that I'm speaking of. Stars and stripes. Old Glory, there's several names. It depends names. on which version we're talking okay. about. All right. Any further discussion on the motion? The motion is that uh, to basically reverse the administrative, make an administrative decision by the uh, city um, and that a, that a variance is not required to fly the, the not required to fly an American flag or any size American flag. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Who seconded that motion? Uh, Mr. Vincent seconded okay. that motion. Thank you. Sorry. All those in favor? All those opposed? Passes four to one. Mr. Fredette was the abstained or the uh, objector. We did do. We did. Thank you for <laughs> making sure I do because I sometimes forget and I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Moving on. All right. Any old business come before the board? No other old business. No other old business. All right. Moving on to new business. First item is a rehearing. 396 High Street LLC is seeking a special exception. Oh, let me hold on. Let me get Mr. Jones back up here. Yeah, take it. 396 High Street LLC is seeking a special exception from Table 4.A.1 to convert existing office building to multi-unit dwelling for property located at 396 High Street in a residential slash commercial RC district, Assessor's Map 36, Lot 45A, ZBA Case 10-2024. It's a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Ms. Crosley. Okay. So this is a start over of the application, but as you know, you heard the um, first rendition of this application at the August 7th meeting where it was granted for the special, exce special exception. 
um, with the condition for the planning board to conduct a special review of traffic flow in and out of the site um, due to an appeal filed by an abutter uh, for a motion for rehearing the board granted this rehearing based on the finding an error in their documentation of the decision process the applicant is seeking a special exception to convert an existing structure to a 14 unit apartment building um, the 14 units are consisting of 11 one bedroom units and three two bedroom units the property is required to at least based off dimensional standards be 70,000 uh, 70,250 square feet the existing lot is 1.7 acres which is 74,000 923 square feet with 117 feet of frontage along High Street and 433 feet of frontage along Stackpole Road. If the special exception is granted, it will go to the planning board for site full site plan review. The property history is they have um, a couple variances that were granted in one in 86 for developing a 28 by 54 building, commercial professional office, and a variance for in 95 from table 5A1 for relief from the front yard setbacks to construct a 2,200 square foot addition. Um, but the applicant has addressed the criteria for special exception so the board can take action on the application. Okay, any questions for Ms. Crosley? Seeing none, will the applicant please come forward? Explain why we should grant this grant this special exception. Excuse me. State, state your name, please. Good evening. My name is Mark Smith, manager of 396 High Street, LLC. My remarks this evening will be similar to that of the meeting held on August 7th when the board approved my request for a special exception, finding that all seven of the criteria were met. To recap, our group is under contract to purchase the former Seacoast Ready Care building located at 396 High Street. The zone of the property is RC, and I'm here this evening seeking a special exception for a multifamily use. Our group has been completing due diligence on this building for some time and believe this property is a great fit for multifamily use. The property has sat vacant for several years, and we believe this is an excellent location to add to the much needed housing stock in the city of Summersworth. Our current concept leaves the exterior of the building virtually unchanged, with the exception of adding windows and doors for egress. Additionally, the grounds would be manicured and cleaned up, breathing new life into the site. There are several other permitted uses within the RC zone that would not require a special exception, such as fast food, a hotel, a gym, shopping mall, and a boarding house, to name a few. We've completed some due diligence on these permitted uses, specifically a boarding house, but feel strongly that a multifamily use would be the best fit. In reviewing the public comment made by Mr. Conlin, he raised concerns related to trash, noise, potential disturbances, exterior lighting, traffic, etc. I feel all these permitted uses would have more impact on the concerns he has raised. No matter the use, they will all have trash, some element of noise, exterior lighting, and traffic. However, I feel that it is what ordinances are for to control these concerns and will be required and we will be required to adhere to those ordinances. In reviewing the criteria for a special exception in the zoning ordinance, this proposed use meets all seven of the criteria. Criteria one, the proposed use, multifamily, is a use that is permitted with a special exception within the RC zone. In reviewing the planning, if this project were approved, it would adhere to the R3 zone, providing density for the proposed 14 apartments. To reiterate, we are not seeking any variances. Criteria two, the site is located on a high traffic road, high street, with several different uses in the immediate neighborhood. There's both residential and commercial. As noted earlier, the exterior of the building would remain virtually unchanged, just improved. As such, this will not impair the integrity of the district or be out of character from a visual standpoint, as it will look the same. Criteria three, we propose the existing site remain the same as utilities, drainage, access, parking, and loading areas appear more than adequate for the proposed use. The parking lot currently has 50 spaces spread over two lots, 36 on the lower level and 14 on the upper level, with each lot having two ways to enter and exit. Criteria four, 
We don't anticipate any additional adverse effects with this use as it relates to noise, glare, or odor as the closest abutter is located across High Street. However, we propose installing additional landscaping throughout the site in an effort to control potential adverse effects, specifically along the east and south sides of the site to provide an additional buffer. Criteria five, there is currently adequate and safe pedestrian and vehicular access to and into the site with four ways to enter and exit the parking areas, 50 parking spaces, sidewalks along Stackpole Road and High Street, crosswalks within the parking lot, and walking paths around the property. Criteria six, in an initial review with the city engineer, the proposed use will not place an undue burden on the current utilities. I've attached an email from Amber Hall to the original application. Criteria seven, we don't believe there will be significant adverse impacts resulting from the proposed use upon the public health, safety, and general welfare of the neighborhood and city. However, given the feedback raised by an abutter regarding trash, rodents, and light pollution, I'd like to add that we do plan on ha to have a dumpster behind the building that will be in a complete enclosure. We propose all existing lighting will be downcast lighting and obviously adhere to the ordinance. And we will maintain the landscaping weekly, which will include picking up any trash around the property and parking lot. In closing, we believe this project would greatly benefit the city and residents by providing 14 new apartments to the much needed housing stock. Thank you for your time and consideration. All right, thank you very much. All right, we'll ask you to have, sit, have a seat. We'll have some, any uh, one person wants to speak either for or against it, please state your name and your address. Any would like to come up? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Shane Conlon uh, from 2 Cinnamon Ridge Road here in Summersworth, New Hampshire. Uh, I have a presentation here. I'm not sure if we should shut the lights off and drop the screen. Shane, there's a remote. If you hit the power on, the projector turns on. All right, so can you hear me okay? I'm um, just gonna start from the beginning. I have a lot of neighbors here today that aren't familiar with the process that's taken place over the last couple of months. Um, but basically, just starting off here, um, here's just a photo from my neighbor's house, um, 5 Stackpole Road. Looking across the street to the front entrance of the old Seacoast Ready Care Building, um, 396 High Street. Um, I just took that photo recently just to guy just to give you guys you know a starting picture of you know what we're looking at here as a neighbor um, um, so this was the building while in operation this is a medical facility operating since 1987 this building operated Monday through Friday it had two different hours of operation it operated from 7 to 4 p.m. and 7 to 5 p.m. Um, during that time. Uh, just a little bit about the site. Again, 396 High Street. It's situated on the corner of Stackpole Road and High Street. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it driving by on High Street. It's pretty prominent. Um, it really sticks out in the landscape. It has roughly uh, eight parking spaces off of the high street entrance. 
and depending on how you count the handicap spaces, uh, currently 31 parking spaces. It's located on a 1.7 acre lot. It abuts the Idlehurst Elementary School. You have Cinnamon Ridge to the south, and you have, of course, High Street, um, creating the, the border to the north. Um, it's zoned RC, as you guys know already, and it closed as of May 14th, 2021. So since that time, the property's just been vacant. Um, again, so just for folks that aren't familiar with the special exception process, um, a special exception, I'm not going to read it all, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, but a special exception is a specific permitted land use that is allowed when a clearly defined criteria and conditions contained in this ordinance, the special exception um, section of the zoning ordinance are met. Um, and how, how those conditions are met, we'll get into later. But for right now, I just want to state that it's only permitted if the conditions are met. So just want to be as clear as possible. Um, and again, this almost everything I pull here is from your handbook, the Board of Adjustment in New Hampshire, Handbook for Local Officials, the 2023 edition. Uh, so this is from the zoning ordinance, you know, just basically stating what the role of the zoning board is. Just determining does the applicant meet the seven criteria. In this case, the, actually, I'm going to skip to the next page. Sorry, just give me one second. That's a little, is it possible to zoom in? Well, um, just so the public is aware that's not familiar with the um, zoning ordinances, this is page 146 from the Summersworth Zoning Ordinance, Chapter 19. Uh, it's a table of uses, and if you go down to um, number three, multi-use dwellings, you'll see under special exceptions, um, you know, this, this property as RC falls underneath that category um, because there are not the special criteria to make outside of those seven criteria that we'll get into later um, they must follow the seven so it's it's hard to see but basically if if this was in the R2A all this property would have to do is fall within the physical requirements of the lot but because it's in RC it has to follow the seven uh, specific requirements to qualify for a special exception. Um, so here's the seven general conditions that apply. I'm just going to kind of whip through them here again. There's quite a few people here on Cinnamon Ridge and surrounding neighborhoods that aren't familiar with the zoning ordinance, so I'm just going to do a cursory overlook. Um, so the first one is, does it meet the um, zoning ordinances and special regulations for the use? I'm not really debating that tonight here. Um, I'll get into specifically which ones I'd like to speak to more. Um, the next one is, will it not impair the integrity or be out of character with the district or the immediate neighborhood? Uh, the second one, will proper operation of the use be ensured by provisions and maintenance of adequate and appropriate utilities and drainage and other you know necessary requirements of operating this type of facility. Uh, next, the potentially adverse effects of the proposed use on nearby properties, including but not limited to, again, noise, glare, odor, will be eliminated or controlled through screening or buffering designed to alleviate such effects. Um, is there adequate and safe pedestrian and vehicle access? Um, people behind me might speak to this, but at the moment, nine out of ten times, you can use the crosswalk in front of Cinnamon Ridge. Nobody stops. So I'm going to guess that this will just exacerbate the issue. Um, next, the proposed use will not place an undue burden on any municipal service. Again, there's a letter from the engineer here at City Hall 
I'm not debating that. Uh, and lastly, there will be no significant adverse impacts resulting from such use upon public health, safety, and general welfare. So this is a really important part that's, you know, important not just for the applicant, but the ZBA before. I spoke to this um, in every letter and meeting we've had since, but again, the public should be aware of what's required of both parties, so I'm just going to kind of do some highlights here. Um, and again, as was mentioned at the last meeting, um, there was questions about the validity of some of these Supreme Court cases that I have referenced. And I would just like to point out that I would say 90% of these cases are in your 2023 zoning handbook. Um, but I'll continue here. You know, so as noted by case law, there must be sufficient evidence provided by the applicant. They can't just, you know, make comments about what they want to do or what they plan to do. There needs to be some kind of plan on paper provided to the ZBA to have a special exception granted. Um, you know, I, I don't know how special exceptions have gone in the past, but I've just spent many many hours researching case law and again and again this issue comes up that without proper documentation of how the applicate applicant excuse me is going to meet these seven statutory requirements they don't have a standing for an approval um, you know in the case of Henron versus the city of Portsmouth if you guys read that case I know we don't have the time here but it's you know a cookie cutter case that applies 98% match for match to the specific situation. Um, and again, all, although in the you know in the fourth bullet point here, although the board can rely on its personal knowledge and certain factors in reaching its decision, its decision must be based on more than mere personal opinion of its members. Um, you know, and lastly, the applicant has the burden of presenting sufficient evidence to support a favorable finding on each requirement, each of the seven requirements. Um, next is, you know, is the zoning compliant? I'm not here to debate that tonight. I trust that city staff members have looked into, you know, the densities. It's based off of R3 density, and that's just the way, you know, the zoning ordinance reads. So. Um, I'm not going to speak anything to that. So here's just some pictures that I've seen around neighborhoods. Um, you know, does it maintain the integrity character? These are not saying specifically that the applicant is going to have a property like this, but here's some examples in an R3 neighborhood of, frankly, things that I don't think any of my neighbors want to see. Um, again, I don't necessarily anticipate or think that this specific person is going to do that, but what's to say in five years this property is sold to a landlord that has much different intentions? So here's some pictures of our neighborhood. Um, here's Sinclair Avenue, which is just north to the property. Um, again, I'm not really going to speak to the pictures, but I just want to give you guys a sense of what the neighborhood looks like. Um, here's the corner of Cinnamon Ridge, the deadly crosswalk I've been talking about previously. Uh, there's my house right there, front and center. Um, I'm about 60 feet from property line to property line. Um, Here's my neighbor, if you're on the street, to my right, which you guys are showing the first photo in the slides, that's their front door. Um, they would probably bear the brunt of the impacts, depending on the flow of traffic, you know, cars illuminating their house, the noise, I'd say they're slightly closer. My house is set back in my lot quite a bit, but, you know, I'd, I'd say they have um, valid concerns about this property and have spoken previously at the first hearing regarding this property. 
Um, just a neighbor further down. This is wedged in between the previous neighbor and Dunkin' Donuts. We have another view here looking north on High Street with Sinclair Ave on your right hand side there. Um, just, you know, again, showing the type of neighborhood that we have. Um, here you have 396 High Street on the left. You guys are looking down towards 400 High Street, further down towards the church. Uh, Bernier Street, which is a little bit further down High Street. These are all neighborhoods that were in that 1500 foot radius that I spoke to at the first hearing. Again, just another shot as the church across the street. Um, so I'm just going to move on to some more of those uh, statutory requirements as put forth in the zoning ordinance. Um, you know, operation maintenance, proper operation of use will be ensured by the provision and maintenance of adequate and appropriate utilities, drainage, access, parking, loading, and other necessary site improvements. I'm going to speak more specifically to these towards the end of the presentation, um, but I just want everybody here that isn't aware of what's happened over the last couple of months, what the requirements are for a special exception. Um, the next one is adverse effects. The applicant needs to address, of course, with evidence, as previously stated, that the potentially adverse effects of the proposed use on nearby properties, including, but not limited to, noise, glare, or odor, will be eliminated or controlled through screening or buffering designed to alleviate such effects. Um, I'll get into this later with a little more detail, but I th this basically speaks to, again, this is for the folks behind me, measures put in place to prevent light, noise, I mean, odor is not typically an issue, but um, it's certainly something to think about. There's going to be 14 units and food waste that was never on the property before. Um, you know, in the spirit of this, typically it would be covered in site plan review, but of course you can get a waiver for buffering. So typically for the folks behind me, this, this alludes to, uh, you know, vegetative or solid buffering of a um, new development to control the effects on abutters. Um, pedestrian vehicle access is a big one. Um, again, the applicant must provide evidence that there's adequate and safe pedestrian and vehicle access to and into the site to accommodate anticipated traffic such that the proposed use will not create unreasonable traffic congestion on continuous or neighboring streets. Um, again, we didn't we didn't get any additional information over the last two months from the applicant. This is a big safety factor. You know, there's a, quite a few kids in the neighborhood that traverse the sidewalk. Um, the sidewalk on the left you see here has the automatic illuminated markers, and the sidewalks we see here on the right are the sidewalks that are actually on site. Again, I'm not going to speak to public utilities. We've kind of gone over that. I don't think there's any concerns amongst anybody that this is going to have an undue burden on any municipal services. Um, public health, safety, and general welfare. Uh, the picture on the right is actually a rat that came from Dunkin' Donuts that was on my property. Uh, we watched it go down the sidewalk when they did some work to the dumpster. Um, you know, the picture on the left, it happens. It's just not something we want to see. Again, it could be a ZBA condition for property maintenance further down the line at site plan review. Um, but basically, uh, one of the conditions of the seven is making sure that the applicant has provided proof that there will be no significant adverse impacts resulting from such use upon the public health safety and general welfare of the neighboring, uh, excuse me, uh, neighborhood and of the city. Um, so what are the powers of the ZBA? State RSA 674-33, 
uh, basically states that in this situation with the seven general requirements, um, the ZBA has the authority to place conditions on any approval, you know, providing that they're reasonable and relate to the spirit of the ordinance in question. I feel like I've hammered these pretty hard over the last couple of meetings. Um, I've tried to voice my concerns as best as possible. Maybe you'll hear from some of my neighbors tonight. But I feel that, you know, that the ZBA has the full authority to place conditions. It was mentioned in previous meetings that it's more appropriate possibly to have these stipulations placed at the planning board level. But to be honest, you know, this is the opportunity to put those conditions in place. If we don't put the conditions in place here tonight or continue it and at a further meeting, as you probably all are aware, if you've looked at or watched, you know, looked at the minutes or watched the planning board meeting, the options out there just to apply for a waiver of the class B buffer or whatever else might be out there in the site plan rules. Um, you know, as a resident and somebody that cares deeply about our neighborhood, I just don't find it necessary for myself to keep coming back again and again and again to further meetings to make sure that these, you know, valid concerns are met. If the applicant applies for a, um, a waiver at the planning board level, you know, why should I have to come back and make those concerns voiced again if we have the opportunity and you guys as the ZBA have the full authority to do so? And I'm just kind of going to get into here the difference between zoning board and planning board conditions. Um, you know, when a condition is placed by the ZBA, that condition survives in perpetuity through the site plan process. I'm sure you guys are all aware of this, but again, there's folks behind me from my neighborhood that are not aware of this process. So I'm just gonna try and get through it as fast as possible. Um, again, your conditions can be based off of all seven special exception requirements. You could pick and choose, that's your authority to which ones are most relevant to the needs of the community and the concerns that have been brought up here tonight. Um, you know, if, if they decide to deviate from that at the planning board level, they're gonna re be required to come back here for case law and state law to either come back, reevaluate, or they can apply for a variance at that point to each of those specific items contained in the ordinance. Um, you know, this provides a much, here as it states, just a much higher level of protection to surrounding properties. You know, I don't know how many folks are back here behind me from Cinnamon Ridge and surrounding streets, but we all have the right to quiet enjoyment of our properties. And the owner also has the quiet right of enjoyment to their properties. But, you know, when you're looking at modifying the use of the property and potential adverse effects, those need to be accounted for. Um, and just here again, planning board, I know I've already hit it, but again, site plan conditions, those can be made, you know, based on recommendations from city staff, public members, uh, board member input, etc. But at the end of the day, the applicant can just come before the planning board and ask that those conditions be waived and I'm not going to make any estimations, but just based off of watching planning board recordings, I'd have to say that that approval is a pretty high rate. All right, so I've already run through all these seven, but you know, basically, has the applicant provided any evidence, physical evidence, to support their claim that this project will not impair the integrity? You know, just me here speaking tonight, I'm gonna say no. They had several months to put something together. Uh, here we are two months later, and not even a shred of paper has been provided. Um, again, if they can't meet the requirements through restrictive conditions as applied by the ZBA, the applicant must be denied. That's just case law. There's multiple examples out there. Um, you know, 
hitting down the second point here, proper operation of the use will be ensured by the provision and maintenance of adequate and appropriate utilities and et cetera. I'd like to um, kind of just look at that word that I put in bold print there, provision. You know, if you look at the Merriam-Webster definition of provision, it's a measure taken beforehand to deal with a need or contingency. Has the applicant provided a maintenance plan or any indication of a shred of a maintenance plan, you know, related to how often the parking lot might be striped, building maintenance, utilities, landscaping, are the leaves going to be picked up in the fall, you know, stuff like that. That's a requirement the ZBA must take under consideration for this approval to go through. Um, just moving down to the next one. And again, I, I hope I'm not boring you guys, but my neighbors back here don't know anything about this, so I feel obligated to inform them about this. Has the applicant provided evidence that their buffering or screening will eliminate and control noise and light? Does the applicant intend to seek a waiver from site plan buffering requirements? If the ZBA finds that it's a possibility, the ZBA should require as a condition that they adhere to the site plan buffer yard requirements. Um, just next is adequate and safe pedestrian vehicle access. I haven't seen a traffic you know, study to see whether or not this is gonna be safe. Probably maybe 30 cars coming in and out of this property. Um, I think that's a big concern. I know we brought it up in the past. It's been discussed, but there hasn't been any evidence or discussion based on evidence provided by the applicant. You know, same thing with adverse impacts, public health, safety, and general welfare. We just yet to see anything on file, on paper, that, you know, this is what it's going to look like, or this is the plan, um, you know, so. So the only question I have here tonight for the applicant when they come back up is, do they intend to apply for any site plan waivers if this is approved? Thank you. Thank you. the screen all right other uh, people would like to speak either for or against don't be shy come on up yep oh state your name and address and then Anytime. you can pull that mic down a little bit just because I'm not I'm not you know, just, I can do it all the time Patty Powers 35 Cinnamon Ridge Road I don't pretend to be an expert here so bear with me with whatever. I have concerns there only because we have a neighborhood area that is children and playing and out. I find like a multi-unit apartment building, is it gonna be conducive to kids going out and playing in High Street or playing ball or doing the ball's gonna go in the road and things like that. That's a concern I have. The, the traffic is another concern I have. And the applicant, how can they guarantee to us that they are going to do what they say they're going to do, keep it up or keep this clean? As Shane mentioned, it could be sold a year from now. And the other question I have is I haven't heard anything about what the apartment, what the costs are going to be. If they're looking at taking care of housing, which I think we all believe and understand that that's a problem. But if Rents are going to be a nice building and this and that. It's going to be $3,000 a month. Who is that helping? It's bringing new people in to get new things, and it's not helping people here in our city who need housing. Last example, and again, I don't know if this is your, your area or not, but let's take a look at downtown on the main street down there. We have how many empty buildings and things that, that could be people that could be doing this kind of thing, refurbishing and having apartments over and businesses that come in and, and bring things into the town, the taxes and things like that. I think we should be looking at something more than that rather than at the middle of our neighborhood and on High Street to have this multi 
you know, building apartment kind of thing. So again, I don't know if this is all the kind of thing, but I just have some concerns, and those are con some of my concerns that I have. Okay. Thank you for your Thank you very much. And lady, lady back, yep. I'm the one that's going to be, besides my neighbor, I'm the one that's going to be affected very much because I live right across you the street. you state your name and address? Sorry. Pardon? Can you state your name and address? I'm sorry. Patricia Duchesneau, 5 Stackpole Road. Thank you. Somersworth. Um, I live directly across the street, and ever since somebody went there to do something, which was two weeks ago, three weeks ago, the damn lights are on all the time. Okay. That burns me. It comes right in my living room and in my other rooms if I have any shades up at night. That is a very big thing. Another thing, okay, it's the traffic. Okay, we talked about that before. We all know Stackpole is used by everyone to go over to the stores. Well, if you're there at 10 to 12 o'clock at night, you should hear. There's no police around, and you should hear the cars and what's going on. That nice little curve in there, which nobody ever decide, you know, thought to take it out of that road, it's bad. Okay, the other people may not hear that, but I live right there. And unfortunately, I've been there for 44 years. So, you know, and I don't want to say anything but there were there was an office building before seacoast ready care was there there was uh, some uh, attorneys who were there they sold to seacoast ready care and then they moved to, to rochester so there have been people there for a while at that time it wasn't too bad my kids were younger the traffic wasn't bad but now it's gotten to the point it's really bad i know somebody said would you would you like to have a business there like a bowling you know some kind of um gym club or something like that the point is we need i know you need more housing okay who are the tenants going to be um how much are the rents going to be is it going to be where uh, where are all these who is going to rent these places you know, we don't know any of that, and it's very concerning to me. And I just hope that when you're all taking things into consideration, you keep my neighborhood safe. I've lived in a safe city, but I don't, I'm starting not to feel too safe anymore. And the police department needs to watch that area. I. They used to come over there and sit and so forth, but I don't know what they do. But somebody has got to do something. 14 apartments is too much for there. I realize it has to be cost effective to put apartments in there. However, how about 10? So we don't have so much congestion. To tell me that you are not going to see anything going on on the outside, nothing else happening, I don't believe that because what about all the piping in there? You know, something may happen now and they may have to pull up pipes and all kinds of things. We, nobody knows any of that. So those are my big concerns. As you can see, I'm, I'm a little old. So, <laughs> you know, maybe some of these things will bother me more than some people who are a little younger, but I don't wanna be forced out of my house because somebody wants to do this. That's my only concern, okay? So what else can I say? And the lighting at night, oh, they used to put the lights out before. When Seacoast Ready Care was there, by 10, 11 o'clock at night, they'd put them out. They'd leave just a couple. But now, I'm gonna have those lights all the time. I don't know how they're gonna set them up and so forth, but it is gonna be very bad for me. So that's my two cents. Okay. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Who else would like to speak? Uh, sir? I'll put it up. Yep. <laughs> Name and address. Uh, Josh Caldwell, 5 Longleaf Lane. Um, so my only concern really is my 
I got twin daughters. They're 10 years old, and they walk that neighborhood all the time. And I feel safe with them walking that neighborhood all the time. Um, I would be really concerned with the added traffic. Um, I would be concerned about, um, you know, people moving into that neighborhood that don't have the same respect for the neighborhood as the people that live there now. Um, I just, yeah, I'm, my, my biggest concern would be the traffic um, and if people were coming through the neighborhood um, because, again, my 10-year-old daughters walk through that neighborhood every single day and I need them to be safe. So, thank okay, you. thank you. Who else would like to speak? Sir? James Manhart, 8 Cinnamon Ridge Road. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little more, uh, maybe on the senior perspective, we've heard about the kids, because the biggest problem is getting out of Cinnamon Ridge now, that big subdivision. Um, is going to that intersection. As the lady previously who lives across the street from where this property is pointed out, there's a big bend there. So as I age and have to make my left hand turn onto Stackpole Road as I get out of um, Cinnamon Ridge, I'm a bit concerned about the amount of traffic because so when ever they fix the parking lot there and stuff that some concern be made about um, that intersection because it's not totally uh, aligned and the um, neighborhood accommodated having the new school there and things one of the silver linings i think of the pandemic is a number of us walk around the neighborhood more. So that intersection, I just wanna talk about that crosswalk also and reiterate <coughs> what uh, Shane said about it. Most people flying down Stackpole Row are above the speed limit. And I agree with the lady, the police disappeared somehow once, um, once we went to the school, I think it's K through two now, at Idlehurst. Once that happened, the police present used to be there during school hours, but people come barreling down that road. You have to insist that you're a pedestrian and point out, and you can't go into that intersection until you're sure they're going to stop. So it's the traffic concern that I would want looked at very carefully. Where I live, in my radius, many, uh, many uh, houses that abut me have people about my age, 68. God willing, if I live till as long as my parents, I'll be with you till 91. <laughs> now, I did inherit my father's knees rather than my mother's because at 91, she could still take the stairs and stuff. But I'd like since I didn't have kids and I helped pay for the school, I like going across there and we use that. School gets multi-purposes over there after school hours. So I'd want that to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who else would like to speak? Going once, going twice. The applicant, please come back up. Do you like to address anything first or do you want us to ask questions? Um, yeah, I'll just do a, a quick response. Um, I appreciate Mr. Conlin's uh, concerns and the abutters' concerns. And, um, you know, the building's been vacant for quite some time and it's been dark and there's been no traffic and now there's sudden talk about developing the site. Um, so um, I understand that, but I, I feel uh, still regards to the maintenance and the trash and lighting, um, there's certain ordinances that have been put in place um, uh, that will kind of police that. And um, also I feel that most of the concerns um, regarding the site plan will be further down the line in the site plan review and planning process. 
Um, also just wanted to reiterate that the permitted uses there will all kind of have similar impacts in my opinion. Um, um, there's permitted uses like a hotel, a shopping mall, gym, a convenience store, a boarding house. Again, those are all uh, permitted uses within the RC zone that I feel you know will all have the same similar impacts. Um, that's all I have. Okay. Open it up for questions for the, for the applicant. Mr. Jones. Um, I guess first, I don't have a copy of the letter from Ms. Hall. Do you mind just reading a condensed version of that into the record? We've I don't have a copy. Is there a copy? Meeting. Okay. Can, we, can anybody? We can get you a copy. Okay. We'll find uh, one. I just want to make sure that's reflected in the minutes. At least the condensed version that the city engineer has signed off on the capacity for that criteria. I think it's as uh, simple as just saying there's no undue burden, but um, don't yeah, quote It me is on pretty that. simple. It's pretty basic. <laughs> No, I mean, just that that's been provided. I just want to make sure that we reflect that. Sure. Um, uh, during all this discussion, I've managed to capture somehow two pages of notes. Um, so I'm going to try and distill everything down, taking out the logical fallacies and trying not to duplicate things. Um, but I have um, abutters who are concerned about uh, lighting, screening, and then the trash collection and ignoring kind of the fear mongering photos of uncollected trash. Um, would you be opposed to a condition mandating the dumpster has an enclosure? I think that's required in the site plan regs anyway, but I think that addresses a lot of these concerns here. Our plan was to do it, and I believe it is a requirement, so yep. the dumpster yeah, will be an enclosure. Property maintenance. Yep. Was exactly. it required by Gina? Ms. Crosley? It is in the dumpster ordinance that requires dumpsters to be enclosed and screened from public view. Right, perfect. Um, moving on, the... Um, Vegetation and screening, um, is there any uh, kind of, you know, undue burden that you feel at the cost of trying to plant kind of on the, I guess, the southerly side of that property, you know, away from the from the remainder of Stackpole Road and the residents that kind of live down the street from there? Yeah, so uh, in reviewing the original site plan that was approved, um, there are some plantings there that have since been removed. Mm -hmm. So our plan would be to um, put those additional plantings back in, uh, specifically along Stackpole Road. Okay, sure. Um, and then lastly, there are already lights in the um, parking lot, correct? Correct. Um, I, I know Summers Resort doesn't have a dark sky ordinance. Uh, would you be opposed to us conditioning that we have shades put on those so that they cast down? No, I think our plan was to do all downcast lighting. Yep. Um, I don't know the fixtures, but we'd probably upgrade to an LED fixture anyway. Okay, um, and then I think further we might get into the uh, crosswalk concern. Um, but just kind of going down through my list, um, you had a residential office building, um, sorry, a uh, medical office building here before. Um, I, th I think we can probably both agree that that's a more intensive use than the residential there. There are 39 total spaces provided on the property. I believe there's more. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, that was what was in Shane's presentation, so I, I took it from there. Um, you have a total of 17 bedrooms proposed and only 14 units. So per our zoning ordinance, you'd only be required to provide 28 spaces. So I think that you meet the parking requirements, at least by the, the small count that Shane had provided. Um, obviously, you have adequate lot size. You have adequate lot frontage. Your only um, reason you're here tonight is just to look at the, the actual use. In terms of pedestrian and vehicle traffic, we have sidewalks and crosswalks already in place. There are turn lanes. There is a signalized intersection immediately adjacent to it. Um, we have a letter from the city engineer that says all of the utilities are satisfactory. Um, is, is the drainage part of going to be part of the full site plan review? Because you said they're going to full site plan review. Yep, drainage would be. Um, be handled at the yep. planning board. Um, yeah, I um, I definitely think that that covers everything that I had heard from the audience tonight um, outside of some of the minor concerns that I'll address with just the members of the board. Thank you. Further questions for the applicant? Mr. Brooks. I, I believe you do own other properties that are multi-unit. Correct. Do you find that at some point, I, I don't know how large all those are, I'm sure they vary, but... I guess is there a limit to how many units a single dumpster will service? 
Is, is there some sort of equation that factors into that? Obviously, if you have a 100-unit building, one dumpster may not be enough is where I'm going with this. Yeah, so we kind of leave it up to our, our waste removal companies. We'll tell them how many units, how many bedrooms, and then they'll decide the yardage and the frequency of um, emptying it. Yep. And, and I that's don't know that offhand, but we, we put it in the hands of the experts. Yeah, obviously they could empty it more frequently as well rather than a second dumpster if they came twice a week maybe instead that would right obviously possibly alleviate that situation um obviously i saw pictures here but they looked like move outs and you know that's a whole different situation um you already spoke to the lighting i mean i sure those lights are probably <coughs> from when it was ready care probably before our zoning ordinance addressed lighting so the fact that you're updating those makes sense um, I, I guess let's talk about the character of the neighborhood um, you know we see a lot of representation here of the neighborhoods that are side streets off of both High Street and Stackpole but your property sits on High Street and Stackpole specifically what would you say the neighborhood description of those two streets are? It's a challenging answer. It's it's uh, a challenging question. Um, so um, there's both residential and commercial, as you know. Um, there's uh, a dentist in the adjoining lot. Um, there's a bridal shop there. Um, there's single family across the street. Um, so that building, I don't feel, would be you know out of character having a residential use, and specifically from a visual standpoint, as I stated, it's it's really going to stay the same from the exterior. And speaking of the exterior, I don't know how many exits and entrances there are, you know, actual doors to for egress at this moment. Do you anticipate adding them per unit, or do you anticipate having a common door that everybody would use there'll be common doors but several i believe three or four common entrance doors okay. i think that's all the questions i have for the moment okay mr hilton what, <clears throat> what type of amenities are you going to be putting in there as far as quality um i know that uh we we're talking everyone was talking about cost as far as are you going for mica are you going granite are you going we haven't gotten that far <laughs> to be <laughs> honest um, but we we have a couple uh, different floor plans that we're working with for layouts some of them leave um, some dead space there's an old mechanical room so we had talked about putting a, a fitness area in there um, there's another area where probably would put like an on-site management office or a leasing office um, but as far as finishes, we haven't got that far to select finishes, but there's some talk about um, the rents, and our plan is to do um, something around the fair HUD market value of those rents, um, but we don't have anything in concrete at this point. What would be the square footage of average on the, the single uh, one bedrooms on the singles um they range um if i had to guess the smallest might be 550 up to seven or 800 square feet okay and um as far as the dumpster pickup i sleep with the windows open most nights still even during the winter and uh we hear the dumpsters pick up early in the morning, clanging, you know, making lots of noise. Well, would you commit to having them picked up during the day instead of first thing in the morning or at nighttime? So that, that would alleviate one of the things for the, the abutters? Sure. That's something we can look into. Yeah, I know um, we have a trash provider now that um, does some properties in Summersworth and Rochester, and it's mid to late morning. Okay. And, I mean, all of us, we just want good neighbors. Sure. You know, we don't want people trashing the place. So, and I, we don't want to be fear-mongering, but also, you know, and we can't, no one knows 
who the new neighbors are going to be. But your responsibility as the homeowner or the owner is to make sure that you manage it well. So please do and uh, uh, be a good neighbor. Mr. Burdett, you all set? Mr. Burdett. One of Mr. Conlon's concerns two months ago, I think, and I think I heard it mentioned again tonight, was his opinion that in order to grant this special exception, the board should review some physical evidence, some representations, some construction concepts. I mean, we've seen them multiple times. I didn't see any two months ago. Do you have anything prepared that you could show these neighbors so we're taking something but hypotheticals in your word? We just have conceptuals for the interior um, layouts, really just a site plan, um, and just the exterior um, site plan that we've been working on, but nothing, again, really set in stone. So no, no drawings that you've paid a professional to do that you would have thought to present tonight? No. Thank you. Mr. Brooks? Concerning the site plan, do you anticipate changing the parking arrangements? Do you, they seem adequate? From yeah, we use? would um, basically just restripe the existing. And how about walkways for pedestrian? traffic around the property is there already sufficient walkways or yeah so there's walkways both along high street and stackpole road um, there's also crosswalks in the parking lot as well that we've maintained do you anticipate putting any kind of outdoor recreational area for the tenants no so really the outside of the property for the most part you would assume would stay unchanged for the most part just using what's existing is already there correct good good right, i got a couple questions so do you do you intend to uh meet all the requirements of the city zoning ordinances yes okay do you okay do you intend to meet all the requirements of city property maintenance ordinances yes The existing facility, the existing lot has ex is existing drainage, different anything. Do you intend to do any major changes to any of that? We do not. Do you know of any problems with the existing drainage facility or, or, or anything in the access and the parking of that area? Not that you know of, okay. No. Um, 14 units, how many, you, you rent, typically rent, um, do you, uh, your other units, you have other single unit um, rentals? We do. And do you typically find that they're filled with uh, one person or two? A one-bedroom apartment? Yes. Typically one, but there are the cases where there's two people. Okay. Yep. Um, that's okay. <laughs> so it could be less than that. Okay, I understand. So your type of tenant that you would typically rent to, what do you, what do you, what do you look for in a kind of a tenant? Um, well, first they all go through background checks. <laughs> um, and... Um, I think you asked me this question before, and they're really all over the board. I mean, we have um, younger professionals, and um, we have, um, it's it's all over the board. But these particular units, they'll be smaller in scale. Um, most of them will be one bedrooms, 11 one bedrooms. Um, so they'll probably just be um, an individual by themselves. Okay. Other questions for the applicant? Final comments by the applicant. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here with that, I'm going to close the public hearing. And first thing we're going to discuss is regional impact. Is that what you're going for, Mr. Uh, Vincent? No, but I will. I don't feel. <laughs> I, mean, I don't see that there's any regional impact. Does I anyone else see there's regional impact? I don't see none either myself. All right. So we will entertain a motion on regional impact. Who would like to do it? And I'll jump at once. Um, you can't, Mr. Hilton, unfortunately. Mr. Prudet. I move that the request of 396, L, uh, 396 High Street, excuse me, LLC, um, does not have regional impact. 
Okay, we have a motion to move a second. Second by Mr. Perkins. Any dis discussion on it? Does it have regional impact on the motion? Motion is that it does not have regional impact. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Passes, 5-0. Okay, discussion. Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, let me give you a little history of who I am because it is kind of important. I served on the fire department in the fire service here in Somersworth for 33 years plus. I was a fire investigator uh, and I was also an inspector, uh, a certified inspector through the state of New Hampshire. That meant that I could, that we, that the fire department went into multifamily dwellings, which was uh, three units or more. And we inspected all the properties in Somersworth. Um, why do I say this? Because I do have a history uh, of um, the inspection program. I know how the city operates. Um, and I can tell you right now that um, in where the city comes involved, uh, I think we're splashing over a little bit here uh, as the ZBA in, into the planning board. Look, our planning board here has some really strict, tough rules. And if you don't want to buy by those rules, they go after you. What do I mean? Well, currently um, there's some cases involved that somebody went before the, Z before the planning board and they proposed to do this. But they didn't do this. They did that. And what happened was is the city goes after them and then they make them fix that because they go back to the minutes of the planning board and what they said. We have a very strict, very strict code enforcement here. So why did I bring up the fire department? Because I've inspected these so-called slum type of properties where the absentee landlord, you know, they live in rye in their million dollar home and they leave the garbage here in Summersworth. That's what we've all seen. Do I mean any disrespect to anybody? No. That's what the facts are here. Uh, people would come in the 80s and 90s and buy property and become absentee landlords, which would cause these problems, which are concerns because I've lived in this city like the young lady out back of 44 plus years, I think, uh, for 60 years. I currently own a home here. Uh, I've lived here my whole life. I've been involved with the city, so I really care what happens. <clears throat> One of the pictures of the photos that were shown up on the screen uh, actually was of the Franklin Street area. And I, I'm, I don't mean to offend anybody in the Franklin Street area. Uh, sometimes we have to take on um, <laughs> residency, maybe less desirable sometimes um, because of affordability. Uh, it's out of uh, control sometimes, especially more today than years ago. Um, that was a property, a problem property for years. And the city went after and finally got something done. And they would just move their stuff out on the sidewalk when they moved. There was constant trash there. If you look, if you go to the code enforcement records, you'll see that code enforcement was on that absentee landlord for years. He was a guy who had a lot of money and really didn't care about Summers Earth. But we went after him, the city went after him, and, and then finally got it taken care of. A little history about where you live. Certainly not the same community that it was 30, 40 years ago. There was no Walmart. There was not Home Depot. It was not this massive traffic influx that we have. It's, it's, almost, it's almost sad, isn't it, that growth actually comes into play and it kind of squeezes us, you know? Like the, just a simple thing is lights coming in our, in our home. You know, that road on Stack Pro Road is developed. So when you turn off of High Street, you have, you have no choice to have the lights in your road. There's a curve there. You go by the Dunkin' Donuts, there's a curve. Where's the lights going? Right into that house right there. Sad. It's almost like, you know, why didn't Dunkin' Donuts or somebody around there put up a blinder, a fence that that wouldn't happen, you know? So where am I going with that is like, this whole community has changed. Then they go and drop a school there. It wasn't my decision. I, I was actually against it, but after further, um, after further 
thinking about it, I think it was the best decision. Um, was it the best spot? That can be, you know, debated. Um, but we have definitely taken and made a big impact on that. You talk about traffic. Yeah, traffic has definitely increased. When I go down to, uh, when I want to go out of the city, I have to go down High Street. Man, I'm in traffic and the lights and However, the city has made some changes uh, with that to try to make that traffic flow. We've invested uh, almost $100,000 in uh, traffic signals. So when one turns green, they all turn green so you get that traffic all out. Even though sometimes during Christmas, holy Toledo, huh? The backup is way back, you know what I mean? These are things that happen when you have growth. If Summers were, was still a city of 6,000, Wow, it'd be kind of great, I think, you know, it'd be in that nice, quiet community. However, we have growth. I mean, can we stop the growth? I don't, we can't. We, look what's happened. Let's talk about, let's talk about, we, someone, you, you had explained um, the crossing, uh, the crosswalks. This is where I say, uh, we're kind of splashing over from the ZBA to the planning board. The planning board has the right to offer or uh, take on what they call off-site um, improvements. One of those things can be those flashing lights can be the off-site improvements. To be honest with you, I I'm really not, I'm surprised that we haven't had that. The city, has re as of recently, has been um, making uh, crosswalks. Uh, you're going to see a new one over here uh, by Constitutional Way uh, where you cross the street. You push a button. Those flashing lights, that was one of the photos. Um, those are going to be installed there. And um, like I said, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea for the planning board to make that an off-site improvement, which I think is a small price um, considering the safety of the people and because it's so congested um, we want to be able to make that uh, we want to be able to make that um, uh, pedestrian traffic flow better uh, and it's only right uh, one of the biggest things is maintenance uh, and I personally think one of the biggest things is trash even though you have um, uh, the dumpster company and one of the comments was made like well like you know they can come in at a certain time in the morning now this is city ordinance here's an example i got a call a couple months ago i am a city councilor i got a call a couple months ago from someone from idlehurst it was a teacher and every morning about five o'clock four o'clock she heard the clanging and banging of Whatever company comes to do it in a truck, it lifts the, the dumpster up, you know, it clangs, the doors of metal, boom, and puts it down, and it, and it woke her up. And she called me, and I said, well, there's a city ordinance. So we called them, nothing happened. We had a police officer go over and uh, say, hey, there's a city ordinance here, and you're in violation of it. Knock it off. And it hasn't happened since. There's only one other thing about a dumpster company sometimes is, on a windy day, and this is where I feel for you people, when on a windy day, you know, you get the dumpster, it comes up and it lets it go. And sometimes that trash blows out. So I'd have to say to the, um, to the man who's coming before us, the, the applicant, uh, that you, you pay a real good attention to that if this passes because uh, that can really mess up a neighborhood. It probably already gets messed up from us putting our recycling out and wind comes and blows it all over the <laughs> everywhere. By the way, if that happens, you could pick up the phone and call Public Works. Public Works will come out and send a crew out and pick that up. It, it does happen. However, it's sometimes tricky when you get paper. They're chasing paper for hours, you know. So there is a sacrifice sometimes. Um, one more key, and I'm sorry to be so long-winded, Mr. Mr. Chairman, is that um, uh, the maintenance. I just want to reiterate that property maintenance here are very strict uh, to the point where I've seen that if you don't paint your house, they're knocking on your house door going, hey, this looks terrible. Now, 
why would you, I mean, we put this property maintenance program in, in place and people say, well, you know what? My house is my castle. If I don't want to paint it, I don't have to. Yeah, but today what's happening is this, is if you have a nice home here and you have a trash pit here, which is for a home, that has a direct, that has a direct influence on your property value. That's why the city developed uh, property maintenance in code enforcement, because we live so long with this, with the, the trash, so to speak, with the trashy homes. Um, and don't get me wrong, there are cases where some people just can't afford it. Um, but most of the time, people, either absentee landlords, even though they're single family homes, they still buy single family homes, don't maintain. Uh, so I have 100% faith in our property maintenance and code enforcement. Um, visit them, call, and find out how many times they get complaints because they're on the road all the time uh, <laughs> trying, to, trying to really do uh, due diligence. Um, my personal uh, opinion of this is that you've had a vacant building um, sitting there for uh, several years, um, I think uh, my, my opinion would be to um, develop it, bring people in. We have a shortage of home, uh, apartments and homes here, uh, living facilities, so to speak, um, and give it a chance, and it may bloom into something really nice. There was also a comment about um, where will they play? There's a school right by it with open fields. It's open to the community. If there's kids... Well, well, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong, but the last time I checked with the school district, they had no problems and they didn't have no trespassing signs up. Okay, then my bad, my bad. Uh, nevertheless, um, I think that the project would be a uh, an improvement to the city. It'll benefit. Uh, does it is it out of sorts in the area? Uh, I I don't really believe it is, and. Uh, that's my say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. What we're going to do is do, if you want to make a general comment, that's fine. I'm going to go through each individual criteria. I think you brought up some in, in, good point. I mean, the, some, some of the abutters brought up some interesting points um, that would indicate that the city may not be enforcing some existing ordinances or rules or la lack of police presence. Um, but a lot of the things that they brought up are, aren't within the control of the property owner or this property owner. Mm -hmm. We all know we don't like our neighbors telling us what to do. They don't, we don't want them to tell us they can, we can cut a tree down or not cut a tree down. So the, each pro, every property owner has their own rights. Um, so we have to consider that. So any other general comments before we go through the criteria? Feel free. All right. So we're going to go through the criteria uh, to make sure we clearly co cover it and whether we feel it meets the criteria or does not meet the criteria. So the first criteria is explain how all requirements of this ordinance have been complied with, including any special regulations for use, which are set forth in the chapter. Ms. Cross, I'm going to ask first you, do you know of anything where the applicant will not meet, will not meet the requirements of the ordinances? Um, at this time, no, not with the project presented. The 14 units would be compliant with the density regulations, and then... Um, you inquiring for site regs as well, or just for zoning ordinance? Whatever you feel is applicable. Um, I think for the zoning ordinance, for density, and those aspects that has been presented and discussed, those are compliant. Um, and then it's an existing site. It will go through site plan regulations for further review and aspects of that. Okay. And the applicant said they intend to meet all, the, or they don't know of any requirements. They do not know. Mr. Brooks. I'd just like to note, I think this is a collect-all for this section of the ordinance you know it's just the first one that says it has to meet everything else listed after this obviously we've got six more to go through and i think it speaks more to that you know which the city sets these out the city council in the zoning has determined these are the criteria we've got to look at could they need these up and dress them up and make them more specific like maybe the noise has a certain decibel level sure but we just have what's here now to go with so I, I think that's just a collect-all saying everything following this is what we need to be looking at. And obviously, we're probably going to touch on all of those. Let's hope so. All right, any further discussion on whether it's going to meet the ordinance requirements? 
Okay, second one is explain how the request will not use will not impair the integrity or be out of character with this district or immediate neighborhood which is located. Discussion. Mr. Brooks and Mr. Fredette. So the character of this neighborhood, it's I wouldn't say it's unique, it's disjointed maybe. You look around, there's many different uses within eyesight of it. You've got the Dunkin' Donuts right across the street. You've got a church just a couple buildings down from there. You've got a dentist next door. You've got a hair salon, I think, diagonally across the street. You've got single house, single unit residences across the street. I, I don't see that there is a clear character here other than a busy, thorough, throughway corridor of our city that really, I'd say the state of Maine puts a bigger impact on with everybody living in Maine and driving down to Portsmouth. So um, I, I don't think that this changes the character. Okay. For a discussion, Mr. Fredette. Yeah, I mean, I would agree, not a neighborhood that has a particular characteristic. Um, I would say, in general, it's not going to change a mixed neighborhood any more than any other use that would have to be fitted there, really. Yeah, I mean, looking at the property, I would, it directly abuts the school. The school school is a big a big abutter to it. Um, who's got what going on here? That's a uh, trouble with the fire alarm, I think. Luckily, we get somebody from the fire service or Good previous thing we have fire. Good I'm wondering what's going on here. Should I be, you know? Um, yeah, there's many, as, you, as was discussed, there's many uh, different things in this neighborhood. Uh, for, it, it's, it's the use that we're talking about here. I think it would be out of character if you tried to put a multi-unit housing in the middle of all a bunch of bit tall businesses, or you tried to put it in the middle of Cinnamon Ridge. Um, but based on what's in the general vicinity there, there's single-family single, single family houses, there's uh, condos down the, da right down the street, there's the, uh, as we talked about, all different bi businesses, the greenhouse. Um, and then if you look at what's allowed there without an exception, such as a hotel, a motel, or a fitness center, it has no more impact or change of the area, the use has no more impact than they would have on the, on the uh, surrounding property. I'd also note that, you know, obviously we have a lot of neighborhoods off of this road, you know, whether it be Cinnamon Ridge, Bernier, across the street, Sinclair, they're all neighborhoods that are just off of this busy cor corridor. So they all have, they may have their own little unique character to each street or small neighborhood, but, you know, this sits right out on a busy corridor that's certainly not. You know, obviously it's next door to all of these, or at least in close proximity. But again, this sits right on that busy corridor, and all these uses, like you described, certainly wouldn't change it. Okay. Item three. Explain how the property operation use will, will be ensured by the provisions of the maintenance or adequate and appropriate utilities, drainage, access, parking, and loading, and other necessary site improvements. Mr. Burdett. I would say that in accordance with the size and scope of the project, it will be received full site plan review from the zoning board, correct, Ms. Board. Planning board, sorry, from the planning board, correct, Ms. Crosley? Yes. And yep. all of these listed criteria are all within the purview of site plan review, correct? Yes, those are under site plan as well. Thank you. The board can make conditions if there's certain things that they feel should be a condition of the use. They can and add those as if it's an approval application, they can have specific criteria that they would like as conditions. And I think we discussed some that we'll see how it goes, but this is all within the purview of the planning board and site plan review, correct? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Brooks? Obviously, this t mentions parking. It doesn't really mention traffic. That's further down this list, Correct. so we don't really need to get into traffic yet. But just parking, loading, access kind of touches on traffic a bit. I know I'm sure that nobody would disagree with having the 
planning board look closely at parking and traffic together because it's one and the same really it's all movement of vehicles right um you know obviously i'm sure we're going to set a condition that that is looked at and maybe more specifically when we get to the traffic end of it so i'm just noting that we're not ignoring that we're going to probably touch on that better when we get into traffic okay. <coughs> jones yeah, I mean, they have, um, you know, as I touched on earlier, they have an existing 39 parking spaces, and they only need 28 per ordinance, so the parking is adequate. The access in and out of the site is adequate. It's at a signalized intersection. It's on lanes. It's on a road that has turn lanes, um, you know, a shared turn lane in the center for left-hand traffic. There is no decel lane for the right-hand traffic, but there's also no space for that. Um, so I don't think that's anything that we can really touch on tonight. But uh, we had a letter saying that utilities are adequate, so I think that the proposal as provided fully meets criteria three. Right. I, additionally, the site is already in use. It already has ha, ha, has been used. It's gone through its first round of the site plan review, or and, and, and been successfully used. And are not proposing any significant changes, or any changes particularly to the outside. But the use will change, which could have effect. So you have to consider it. And and considering that use, I mean, a doctor's office has far more trips in and out through the day. Maybe more. More focused during a time frame that they're open but they certainly should have the capacity to move cars in and out as they need to okay for a discussion on item three Item oh, Mr. Vincent, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree that uh, an office has um, the traffic in and out but not at night that's just something to point out um, uh, it doesn't have it at night because Traffic's actually considered under item five. No, so. I'm talking about enter what, what Mr. Brooks was talking about. Yep, yep, okay. uh, he was talking about um, yep. that the facility in and out. So at night, it's, it's not because they weren't open at night. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the point. That's what I mean. This will just be spread out more, so it's not focused. But, yeah, the time frame changes. I, yep, you know. good point. All right, number four. Four is potentially adverse effects of the property used on nearby properties, including but not limited to noise, glare, or odor will be eliminated or controlled through screen or buffering designed to alleviate such effects. Mr. Fredette. Again, I think we touched on this already. Um, I think we talked about some downcast lighting. I think that's a reasonable condition if the board's happy to put that on there. Um, also talked about making sure there's reasonable buffers on the uh, landscaping buffers on the south side, something we could put in there, and I, we've done that in the past. Also, you know, again, this is going to go before the planning board. Mr. J Mr. Brooks. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, Mr. Brooks. You guys confused. Obviously, you know, we, we can ask the planning board to look at this, but there's already an ordinance that stipulates that the lighting has to be downcast. So regardless of whether the planning board looks at it or not, it's not supposed to flood out onto other property. So maybe there's older ho lighting now. Obviously, that's probably going to be changed simply to bring it up to code. And because this is a significant change, code gets looked at. It's not, if it stayed a doctor's office, I'm not so sure they would have to go through this procedure. So just the fact that changing the use, they have to go before the planning board, and they're going to look far closer at everything. That's what the planning board does. Could we ask the planning board to look at everything beforehand, have a plan, and draw everything up before we approve this? I don't think that's the way it works, unfortunately. Can we put stipulations on it that the planning board address this, that, and the other? Absolutely, and I'm sure that's what we're going to do. Mr. Fredat, then Mr. Vincent. Um, Ms. Crosley, just to be clear, if the lighting, would the lighting have to be changed under a change of use, or could the existing lighting stay in place? I'm not sure that that's a correct statement that the lighting would have to change if it's there and functioning lighting just want to clarify that um it can be reviewed and that we can definitely make that a requirement if that is to make sure that that is how it is addressed by the planning board to ensure that it is following the current site plan regulation and that it is the downlit and shielded that it does not trespass onto properties any more than what is permissible by the ordinance which is for residential properties that it does not exceed 0 0.2 foot candles on receiving for the commercial properties and 0 0.1 foot candles for receiving residential properties 
Um, but yes, I do think that we would look at the lighting and, but if it's something that the board wants to make sure, again, you can put that as a condition. How's that, Mr. Burnett? Thank you. Mr. Vincent? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the things uh, that is always a problem is glare, um, and that's from vehicles. Uh, so I think screening uh, is definitely important. Um, <coughs> just to re-elaborate, re um, but the toughest thing is, is vehicle glare. <laughs> It's, and we have problems with it all over the place. It's because vehicles are moving. <laughs> They're moving in low and high beam. So I have to take, ask my neighbor to not shine his headlights in my house? I, you know, it's, 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 it's a- Yeah, exactly. It's a tough situation. That's, that's my point being. Situation. Yeah. And if you, if you buy a house, there's a house in my neighborhood where there's a corner and you, you guarantee when you're going by their house, you're shining the lights right in their, their, their living room window. Exactly my point, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Right, Mr. Brooks and Mr. Jones. Yeah, I, I certainly think just to cover all bases here, it's worth putting in a stipulation concerning the planning board looking at the lighting and making sure that that's addressed to not cause undue glare onto the neighboring properties, just as our zoning already stipulates. But just to reiterate that, I'm sure that I'll be adding that in to any motions and conditions that we put in tonight. Um, you know, and glare, yeah, it's a huge problem with cars. Just lights in general are getting ridiculous on cars. And, you know, I'm not going to be as long as Mr. Vincent, but I've worked in the automotive industry my entire life. The lights are ridiculous. I can't believe they're allowed, plain and simple. Um, I just got back in the towing industry after taking 10 years off. And, wow, I thought the roads were unsafe when I stopped doing it 10 years ago. It's only gotten worse. People don't pay attention. People shouldn't have licenses that are driving in my opinion, and the amount of people that hold a phone in their hand while they're driving, I sit up higher. I, I can give you an accurate count. It is way too many. It's almost half the people driving. So nothing that we're going to be able to solve, and this goes to pedestrian traffic and everything, you, you have to look out for yourself. When I get out of the truck to load up a car on the side of the highway, guess who's there to save me? Nobody. That's me. My stripes that they put reflective lights, you know, stripes on my shirt, mean nothing maybe if i could have a squirrel out there on a leash that might do something but nothing else will trust me mr jones um yeah i think the application fully meets item four i would recommend the following conditions um to the board even though uh i know that ordinances exist to address these um, one is a lighting plan be submitted along with a site plan application another is that vegetation screening goes around the perimeter of the parking area and then lastly, the dumpster is fully enclosed. Okay. Uh, we all set on item four? <coughs> item five, explain how this is adequate and safe pedestrian and vehicle access to and, in, to and, in, and into the site to accommodate anticipated traffic such that the proposed use will not create unreasonable traffic congestion on contiguous or neighboring streets. Mr. Fredette. Mr. Crosby. Off the top of your head, do you know what the vehicle count is on High Street per day? I have information for not this particular section of High Street, but I can tell there's about 23,000 vehicles per day that are near um, the start of Summersworth on High Street. It does reduce down to about 12,000 vehicles per day once you get after the intersection of um, like the CVS Rite Aid intersection. No problem. That's fine. I just didn't want to get lost in the weeds, but my only point is the main thoroughfare is a minimum of 12,000 cars per day, and it supports those cars. Uh, Stackpole Road supports the school. I don't think another 15 or even 28 cars is going to change the traffic drastically. Mr. Jones has made legitimate points about all the engineering angles. I don't think there's anything here on this. Mr. Jones and Mr. Brooks. Yeah, I'll reiterate the engineering manual. Um, the traffic generation for the IT manual for residential, it varies for apartment multifamily buildings, but for a single family residential, it's two trips per day. You have someone leaving for work in the morning, they're coming home at the end of the day. An office building that was here as a pre-existing use would have similar. They have employees arriving at the beginning of the day and they're leaving at the end of the day. They, however, have clients coming in through the entirety of the day, so all those trips are removed. And compared to the 2020 condition when this office was operating, to the new condition with these units, there should be a reduction in traffic volume entering and leaving the site. 
Mr. Brooks? I was going to say, this is something really the planning board tackles. Um, you know, do we need to put a stipulation on it considering, concerning traffic? Absolutely. They need to look at this. But again, this is their wheelhouse. This is what they do. We're here to decide on a variance or, in this case, a special exception. Do we have things to look at and consider? Absolutely. But as far as how this is going to work as a site-specific traffic in and out, that's what the planning board is tasked with. That's what they do day in and day out. That is what they do. And, you know, I don't know what their answer is here. I'm no expert on it. Mr. Jones here obviously has a little bit of insight. He works in that field. But I don't know. Maybe Cinnamon Ridge needs to be one way off of um, Stackpole because maybe that would prevent the conflicting cars trying to turn out and make a left there. Maybe they should go down to Deer Run and come out. Maybe that'd be the safer option here. I don't know. I'm not a traffic expert. But just a couple thoughts. Maybe the entrances in and out of this site needs to have a one way in, one way out to help control that flow. We're not the experts in that, but we can certainly put a stipulation that the planning board, who is far better at that sort of work, looks at this and tackles that and comes up with a real plan that works. Mr. Jones? Yeah, just one more thing to touch on. Um, there are raised sidewalks that connect the building to you know other developments. Um, those are curbed. They have tip downs with detectable warning pads. All the crosswalks are signed and painted. Um, I know that there were some concerns regarding traffic speed and you know the visibility of that crosswalk. I would welcome the board in asking for a condition that the you know offsite improvements for that crosswalk be looked at. But I don't know if I would support such a condition given that it's not really um, relevant to the trip generation from the actual development here. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I mean, as you say, there was plenty of sidewalks. Um, there's 14 units, 20, let's say 20 people, let's say 40 trips a day. Um, look at Cinnamon Ridge, there's 50 houses, two, that's 100 people, 200 trips a day out of Cinnamon Ridge. Um, down the street we have Sunningdale, again, more than 50 houses, 100 people, over 200 trips a day. I don't know what comes out of Dunkin' Donuts, you can guarantee there's like 50 <laughs> an hour coming out of there. Um, the school employees, there's 90 employees in that school, two trips a day. There's kids coming in and out. There's events at night. There's certainly plenty of traffic on that road. There's no question it's a cut-through road. There's no question if someone who bought it back in the 50s, there's definitely a lot more traffic on there now than there was back then. Will the, these 40 trips a day affect or make the roads congested in that area? No. They won't. These, these people spread out over 20 hours a day in the day, these, these trips are not going to affect or make condition on those roads. It would be unfair to jeopardize the property owner for an, an unfortunate pre-existing condition of a road that some people have issues, has curves in it, so, you know, they have cars don't stop for crosswalks, um, the amount of traffic. It's not that property owner's fault that all this has happened, and he's not going to really contribute to the crosswalk violations or the traffic on that road. It, it, they are so small in, in that uh, issue. And we already talked about High Street has over a thousand cars per hour, so it can't it can't possibly affect High Street. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I, I like that you brought up the curve. That's a good point. I, I think the curve is actually a good thing. That's slowing traffic as it comes down around there. And then you're coming right up to a signalized intersection, so speed yeah. at this intersection is not going to be very high. Um, you know, congestion would be a, a different consideration the planning board would make, but certainly um, speed in terms of public safety would would be very low here. Okay, Mr. Brooks. I would also argue that corner allows them to see the light and turning yellow and they can accelerate and get out there to beat the light too because this is the driving habits trust me i see them day in and day out um again people are horrible drivers in general not everybody there are some that are out there that are good drivers it is the minority though um really we need police to better tackle that problem it's n we're never going to solve it unless we have a very stepped up police activity that starts writing tickets enough that people start losing their licenses and then they have to think about it it's never going to fix it or maybe stricter regulations on handing out licenses instead of you know cereal boxes i guess but yeah, yeah it's just a problem we're never going to solve exactly all right exactly exactly all right moving number six explain how the proposed use will not replace 
not place an undue burden on municipal services. We have a, uh, a mem an email from the city engineer who said it would not pr place any undue burden on municipal services. Any further discussion on that? The last item is explain how there will not be significant adverse impacts resulting from such use upon the public health, safety, or general welfare of the neighborhood and the city. Discussion. Mr. Fredette. It's an empty building. It's going to have to get reused in some way. Um, I think this place is no undue burden against any other potential use that could end up there. Um, and I don't, I don't see where that this proposal violates this criteria. Mr. Brooks? And this being the last one, I think it's just a collect-all for anything that might have been missed here because every situation is different. You know, we're not always looking at a residence here on a busy intersection. It could be some other obscure situation that maybe is not thought of with the other stipulations here. So I, I see this as more of a collect-all and I think we've covered all of these topics more specifically in the ones prior to this. But I, I definitely think I definitely think that having some sort of traffic looked at is by the planning board is key here as well. Okay. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I think this being a catch all is a good time to go through you know the other items that I heard tonight and just kind of address them. Um, you know, there was people talking about the need for housing. I think any supply helps reason existing building I think is definitely the most efficient use of um, you know constructing new housing that's more affordable than building it from scratch. Um, if it's the property is sold, they would have to come back if it's a dramatically different use anyway. We have our ordinances in place to protect against that. Um, we have um, letters from town officials that you know everything is going to be adequate in terms of uh, services. Um, we don't have any control on police presence on Stackpole Road. Uh, that is certainly not our department. Um, what tenants move in and out of the building, that's not our department either. Uh, in terms of you know, maintenance and trash collection, um, I think we have ordinances in place that are sufficient to handle those. If the board wishes to tack anything on, I think that would, uh, you know, that would be up to the board. Um, so I, I think that um, trying to lessen the units here, I don't think that this is a, a large amount of units and they have the, you know, the size, the frontage, the, you know, the density regulations are all totally met. Um, so we're really just here for a special exception for the use and where they have adequate parking and utilities and you know all that stuff exists I think this is uh, definitely meets criteria seven and that it's not going to damage the public safety of the neighborhood okay. for that US um, I think you know the concerns that we have that we've heard tonight that we have control over um, we've discussed and I think hopefully I would be willing to make a motion to guarantee that those are reviewed by the adequate bodies that review them i understand that the abutters are frustrated and and would say i am you know as a board member surprised that the um developer here didn't make any kind of a physical presentation to these abutters and i think it is a disservice to them but again they're that that in of itself is not a reason to cannot be a reason not to grant this all right, I'll make a comment. Um, so looking at the, the criteria of public health, safety, and general welfare, so you, I think Mr. Jones actually hit the general welfare pretty good, public health and safety. It's a residential unit. It's, it doesn't generate mixed waste, hazardous waste. It's not like we're, they're bringing in a factory to put it, or, um, you know, it, or they're making, no, I can't say making beer. We already allowed that. Um, but, but they're not bringing in some industry that's going to cause hazardous or undue burden. So I, I think it meets that right criteria. Mr. Brooks, did you want to say it again? Yes. Um, you know, something I just got thinking of is when we talk about how many units are going here, you know, it says the building's over 10,000 square feet. So Could you restrain? My, my form here tells me the building is over 10,000 square feet. It, it doesn't matter. Either, either way, dividing it up, it comes out to, as by my math with that, was around 700 square feet per unit on average. And, you know, you get some developers that will squeeze in units that are only 300 square feet. Um, 
you know, I, I'm just wondering, is it worth putting a condition on here that we limit how many units go into this building? I guess would be where I'm going with this. But it's already I, limited by the, uh, the zoning ordinance. Does it limit it to 14? I don't think they could get to 15. Ms. Crosley, do you know, do you, have you done the math? Do you know? Um, give me one second. But I'm not sure I would I would agree with that they should be able to get in my opinion they should be able to put whatever number of units they're allowed they're currently allowed by the ordinance that should be what they should be allowed to be put in there that's what we have the ordinances for we shouldn't re I don't think we should rewrite them and and that's a fair argument to my point I'm just yep. I've I've seen other ordinances where we wish we had put a limit for other reasons not related to this specifically based off of the density requirements um, a Zero bedroom efficiency studio, which requires an additional 3,200 square foot of lot size, or a one bedroom, which requires an additional 4,000 square feet of lot size, would be attainable based off of the lot size, which is 74,923, and they currently at, are at 70,250 for the required size for the 14 units. So if they could technically add possibly one more studio or um, one bedroom units so based they off of the density. So they certainly couldn't make this 25 <laughs> units or something crazy above the 14. They would be before you for a variance. Perfect. So then I guess we don't need to worry about a reg, uh, limit on that. Right. Any other discussion? All right, where's the board going to go from here? So if, I guess the first board of discussion is, is I don't think my opinion is we, we as a zoning board, I, I do not like to put specific requirements. We can request the, or require the planning board to review stuff. They are the expertise on that. So then that's the process that the city has already previously established, that they approve it, they, 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 make, they decide what's best, what's not best. Um, we should have them look at it um, because if, if we – using our non not, our not being the experts we apply some criteria that makes no sense they have to then come back to the zoning board which is a process that we really don't want to have to go through go ahead mr vincent thank you mr chairman yeah i have to agree and uh they are thorough they are thorough right down to plants if you say you're going to put a plant in there it's got to be this plant so they plant. they've got it Excuse me. They put special yeah, the what type of plants? plants? They're very thorough. They've been doing this, and a lot of the members have sat on this board for years, and they really have it down. There's a lot of educated people on that on that board, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Fredat. Yeah, um, I would just put in. I mean, I don't. Is there a problem with ha just emphasizing that we request that they review the following and then leave it at that? How about the planning board consider? Consider correct. So what are those items? I would say lighting, um, appropriate vegetation buffers um, in the parking area, I think is what I heard. And I would also say that the trash collection is, no, we didn't, we've covered that. The ordinance already covers trash collection. So, um, and I would say the final one is that the traffic would be reviewed. Would you agree that traffic and site access Correct. That's I. I agree. Yes. No. Is that yes? No. Ms. Jones, you're the. I. I think this reviewing site access. I, I think is a larger ball of wax than simply reviewing the trip generation because okay. the trip generation is just a memo. Mr. Chairman, maybe we should just say that they should review everything. <laughs> yeah, we could. <laughs> I mean, come on. Just start anyway, with whatever. <laughs> might not have had to apply for okay. site planners. So like a lighting plan, that's pretty standard. Yep. Uh, trip generation, that's pretty standard. Right. But when we start talking about, you know, the entire traffic flow, we mm -hmm. might start looking at, you know, widenings and desal lanes. But they that. do that anyway. Yeah. It, for their portion in their property, right? right? That's part of the planning board. They look at how traffic comes in and out of the property. Yep. In consideration also with, like, um, fire and life safety access as well. Yep. So is it fair to put in that maybe they consider one-way entrances to help? I wouldn't get specific. I, I think I'd let them make that call. Yeah, I would get specific. Because they're the experts, right? Right. Correct. Makes sense to me. So we had lighting, buffering, and traffic. All right. Who wants to attempt the motion? I will. 
Hey, Mr. Brooks. After review of the application, the file, and all the information presented to the board, I feel that all the special exception criteria have been satisfied because of all the discussion and presentation here tonight. And I move that the request of 396 High Street LLC for a special exception from table four dot yeah, yeah from table four dot a dot one to convert existing office building to a multi-unit dwelling for property located at 396 High Street be granted with the following conditions. The planning board look at and address lighting, look at and address buffering, buffering around the parking areas and so on, and look at and address the traffic around the site. I'll second that. We have a motion, we have a second. Discussion on the motion. Motion to approve the special exception with the planning board that makes specific concerns to lighting, buffering, and traffic. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. All those opposed, it passes 5-0, bearing the special exception, excuse me, is granted. All right, good to continue. All right, item three, bravo. Mackenzie Ventures Inc. is seeking a special exception from tables 4A1 for a multi-unit dwelling on a property located at 472 High Street, Unit B, in a residential slash commercial district, such as map 40, lot 04, bravo, ZBA case 15-24. It's a public hearing. Ms. Crosley. Okay, so the applicant is seeking a special exception to allow the residential use of a multi-unit dwelling at the property. This proposal would include construction of a new building on the lot. The existing lot is 0.79 acres, which comes out to be 34,412 square feet, with 78 feet of frontage along High Street and 362 feet of frontage along Tri-City Road. The lot is a condo lot, which and it would share the parking area with 4A, which is currently an office building with a number of office units. Um, by right, the property can support three residential, bear with me on this one. So three residential units, um, and then an additional either two units that are efficiency units, the studios, or um, one bedroom units, or one, two, or three bedroom unit. So there's a maximum of four to five units that are permissible by right at the property. Um, the property has gone through various different uh, approval site plan processes for the site. Um, some of note and are there was a special exception for a car wash at one time. A variance was approved in 2012 to allow for the construction of a new commercial building within setbacks. Because it was granted prior to 2013, that variance is still a active allowable variance that they could utilize. The 2015 variance that was for the group care facility where that was not enacted within two years, that is no longer, um, that is null and void now. Uh, there was site plan approvals for a new structure in 2013 and in 2016, this connects with the 2015 variance uh, that was that is no longer active, sorry, excuse me. And then most recently in 2019, there was a site, site plan to construct a 4,500 square foot commercial building and infrastructure, which was approved. The applicant obviously did not move forward with that project as the lot is still vacant. Um, if the, all the variance in, app, excuse me, if the special exception is approved, it would need to go to the planning board. It is a new construction of a commercial, a uh, multi-unit building. But they have addressed all the criteria for special exceptions, so we can move forward with this application. Okay, Mr. Jones. Um, I'd like to ask if the chair would entertain combining the public hearings for items 3B and 3C, given that they're so directly related and intertwined, and then <sighs> vote on separately, obviously. Yeah. Um, I had a similar question. I was wondering if one should be before the other, if not. If well, the way the special exception order. is first is we, is we can grant a special exception and they could build three residential, whatever is allowed by size, 
and that they would be all set. And then to get a variant, then they still need the variance to get the full size that they to get all the units they would want. So that's why they went with the special exception first. So if they granted the special exception, would they not be looking for the variance? So they would need the var if they want to build that many units, they would need the variance. Yeah. So to increase just, their density, they so would need the variance. The use the, the special exception would only allow the use of multi multi floor housing, but this will allow the, the more use. So either way, we're looking at them both. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, um, I just wanted to know, is there time constraints on this meeting? There Do we is. have, what, what, what's the time constraints, please? 10 o'clock, correct? 10 o'clock to not take up new business, and then 10.30 to adjourn by. I would, um, I would propose for the fairness of the applicant, because it seems like it's going to be a little bit more detailed, and because the previous applicant absorbed a lot of time, is it a possibility that we can reschedule this meeting for next week? Is that enough time or you need to have so much for a public hearing, correct, and notify? If the, that would need, the applicant would have to agree to that. Um, and you could continue it without further notification as long as it's continued to a date certain. Um, but the applicant would have to agree it to that. And that's fine. I just think that the benefit would be to the applicant, but I it's also the applicant. Go ahead. No, I don't know availabilities of next week. There's other meetings um, scheduled on Wednesday, the Conservation Commission. And so then the applicant would have to answer if this is a like a dire straight thing to get going right away. Yeah. Um, when we could reschedule it to. So right now the only time we could reschedule it to would be the next meeting. Right. Maybe we can ask the applicant. Yeah. The applicant who, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Would you like to, so the question would be if you want to, we can, we can start it. We can certainly continue it in mid, mid sentence at, at 10, at 1030 or, or we would have to come back to the next meeting. Your next regular meeting? Yes. Yeah, cause I don't have another Wednesday evening this month. Um, but I, but I could arrange for, for the next meeting provided I, my only, my only concern is I'm, I'm the property is under agreement and you were under time constraints. Right. My best guess is that, that we could work with that. To work with what? Go we, could, we, could, we could work with coming back at the next meeting as long as I don't have to pay another $500. <laughs> we can, whatever, if, if that would best suit you, whatever would best suit you. Then I would make a motion that we come back on next hey. meeting. Oh, oh sorry. So sorry. 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 Easy. And sorry. sorry. If, if I can just. I didn't realize. I, didn't realize. I didn't realize. I'm sorry. I would just like to say this is totally up to you. The, no pressure from us either way, because if, oh, if we uh, want to sit here and hear this, I'm okay with that. And I am too. I just wanted to, I wasn't sure about the other, the other, um, the other members and how much time this is going to go. I'm fine with it. I just, I just think we should do the public hearing at once so he doesn't have to repeat things. Yeah. Because it's the same. I have no problem with that. Yeah. I have no problem with that. I'm fine with it. All right. So. We will, so to make this work, all right, I'm going to read, read also the second agenda so we can make the public hearing go, be right. So we're also, so we're going to do B and C together, which is, we already read B and C is McKenzie Ventures Inc. is seeking a variance from table 5A1 for a multi-unit dwelling without the required lot size on property located at 472 High Street, Unit B, a residential commercial assessor's map block. 04 Bravo, ZBA case 14, 2024. So we're going to do both public hearings at the same time. So, do you want me to talk about yeah, that? So, Ms. Crosley. Okay, so the special exception is to allow the use of multi of multifamily. Um, the special exception is in regards to allowing it based on what the dimensional standards allow, which is the three to four unit, oh, excuse me, four to five units, depending on the bedroom count. The Variance is to allow for the higher density of the project. The applicant is seeking to have 15 dwelling units where the lot size does not support that requested density. As indicated, and they mentioned this in their special exception, the application, um, excuse me, they are seeking to construct 14 studio, the zero bedroom efficiency, and two and one two bedroom unit to develop a multifamily with 15 units with the above mentioned bedroom count, the following would be required. The first three units would be the minimum lot size of the 26,250 square feet, and then 12 additional efficiency zero bedroom units. Um, you need 3,200 square feet 
per of that 12. So it's a total required lot size of 64,650 square feet. As stated before, the lot size does not meet that. It is only 34,412 square feet. So therefore the variance is required for the increased density, but the special exception for the use is also being sought. Okay. Mr. Ferdek. Do I misunderstand, Ms. Crosley, that they really should not be combined and we probably should hear the special exception first because if the special exception fails, then the variance is moot? So special exception fails, the variance is moot. That is correct. Correct. So and we're going to separate our votes. We'll do two separate votes. So the public hearing, they can, he, as long as the applicant feels comfortable talking about one and the other, and we can, can continue that way. Yeah, I think it just makes the presentation short. I'm all for that. Okay. Any other questions from Ms. Crosley? Is the applicant all set with presenting them both? Sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yes. Okay. So state your name and your address and explain why we should grant them. Steve McKenzie. This is actually in my, in my corporate name, which I'm McKenzie Ventures, Inc. Um, I live at 344 Main Street in Summersworth, Rye. And um, I've, I've had this idea for a while. And, and the idea is I, I was looking for a location to do what <clears throat> I guess we'll call workforce housing. Um, I call it affordable housing, real affordable housing. And, and my, my objective is was to find a location uh, that that would ruffle as few feathers as possible, where I could construct units that would be restricted to two people, such that two people earning entry level wages, 16, 17, 18 dollars an hour, 20 dollars an hour, theoretically, two people could afford to live in that apartment. Um, my, my idea is to structure the rent such that it includes um, heat, hot water, and electricity. Um, I, I, I can't give you a dollar figure, but I, but I can tell you that I, I want it to be somewhere in the $1,200 or $1,300 a month range. Um, I'm not looking to play Santa Claus, but I'm not looking to, I'm, I'm looking to build something that people can afford to buy so that, I, so that in my small way, I can, I can help be a part of a solution to a really big problem. Um, where, where, you know, 20% below market value for a two-bedroom apartment or, or even a studio is, I mean, that's, it might be affordable to some, but it's not affordable to a lot of people. So that, that's my objective, um, and I, I think that, I think I can speak to that successfully. Um, the special exception, yes, is, is to grant a multifamily on that lot, and then the, um, the variance for the, for the density. The units um, that, that we're that we're proposing um, will be in, in the, um, the studios, will be in the 300 square foot. Um, I think they're exactly 300 square feet, actually. Um, and the, the footprint of the building would be what's sort of been listed in the, in the, um, in the multiple listing service. It's 40, 4,500 square feet, it's 100 by 45, and it would be that or less. It might, might be a little bit less. Um, there, if you want me to go down through the the um, criteria, I can do that. If you wanted to, um, okay. For the special exception, um, question number one. I assume I don't need to. You, you all are familiar with you the questions. Thank question you. Now. Question number one: The proposal is fully compatible with and can be tastefully integrated into the surrounding highly mixed use area, which already includes multiple multifamily dwellings. Um, in addition to many, many other types of, um, of businesses and, and, and entities. Question number two, the integrity and character of the district and neighborhood will not be negatively impacted in that there's already a very diverse mix of uses, including office, retail, supermarket, automotive, restaurants, et cetera. Question number three, this is a fairly flat lot. The building will be constructed on a slab. Utilities, including gas, electric, and municipal water and sewer, are either already on site or readily available to the site. The lots on either side of the site are fully developed, and the site allows for adequate parking, all ensuring proper operation and use <coughs> of the proposed building. Another one of, just as an aside, another one of my hopes in this process was to do new construction as opposed to, um, to rehab. I just, I find that um, would, would meet 
my my druthers better. Um, I'm I'm not interested. I am interested in providing um, workforce housing, affordable housing. I'm not interested in being a slum lord. Um, Leases will prohibit any trash, this is number four, leases will prohibit any trash, refuse, or any kind of personal property items from being outside the dwelling unit except as properly bagged and placed in a secured and sheltered dumpster area. Leases will also prohibit any noise from any unit being heard in any other unit. I intend to have really tight leases. I intend to work with council so that I can get as tight a lease as I can legally have because I really want this to be affordable. I really don't want it to turn into a slum. Now, number five, sidewalks, traffic lights, crosswalks, et cetera, currently exist around the site. Um, the additional car, bicycle, and pedestrian traffic generated by this building should be minimal. The increased draw, and this is number six, the increased draw on municipal services should be almost insignificant as a percentage of what is already being used by the surrounding entities. And question number seven, the project when fully completed should not adversely affect public health, safety, or general welfare of the area in any way whatsoever. And in fact, the project should actually benefit the area with so many restaurants, businesses, uh, restaurants and businesses located within easy walking distance of the site. Um, that was my application for special exception. All right, why don't you also then continue through your one for we're going to we're going we're gonna to play this out. Sure. Go through your one for uh, your variants. Yep. Then we're going to then we'll have you go sit back. See if there's anybody who wants to talk, and then we'll have, ask you questions. Very good. Okay, Mr. Should I just ha just a recommendation? Maybe have anybody that wants to speak to the special exception be allowed to speak before he goes into the variants. I don't know. That goes either way. Just a thought. Up to you. Try to be efficient. It is late. <laughs> go ahead, Steve. Okay. Number one, explain, um, this proposal would not diminish surrounding property values as there already exists a wide range of uses, including, again, office, retail, medical, and restaurants, as well as multifamily dwellings. The number two, the variance would be in the public interest in that it would add 15 units of affordable workforce housing to the local market. 3A, I gotta tell you, I find this question three a little confusing. I'm going to do the best I can. Um, 3A1, um, literal enforcement of the ordinance provisions would allow only five units on this property. In today's market conditions, five units could not be rented at less than market value, uh, market rates, whereas 15 units would be of substantial benefit to our city's lower income population. And 3A2, the proposed use is reasonable in that the number of units is in keeping with other multifamily developments in the area and allows the studio apartments to be affordable for entry-level wage earners. Um, and then I, I did put to see question five, the question five addendum, which I will get to in a minute. 3B, um, I'm not even sure I needed to address this given the wording of, of the application, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a shot. The special conditions exist due to, parcel, due to the parcel being sandwiched among a unique array of abutters, including an office building, a large shopping center, a small strip mall, self-storage facility, automotive, automobile repair garage, and, large, and a large apartment complex. Question number four, as noted in question 3A2, granting the variance would allow a number of studio units such as would be affordable to lower income workers. And question number five, I, I went into a little bit more detail. All zoning ordinances are designed to reasonably manage land use in ways that protect the general public's best interests. Like all aspects of life, those interests will evolve as economies, demographics, and community needs change. This city, along with surrounding cities, as well as the entire state of New Hampshire, currently faces a dire need for workforce housing. This project is specifically designed to address that need. Yes, the number of dwelling units requires a variance, but the overall square footage of living space is 4,800, approximately twice the size of many single family homes being constructed today. Yet rather than house just two families, this building would potentially provide housing for 30 people while still maintaining a reasonable density and includes a reasonable number of parking spaces. This project also has many other benefits. Sidewalks, streetlights, and crosswalks exist for public safety. 
There's a wide mix of land uses and businesses in the general area, all within easy walking and or biking distance, including various offices, retail operations, restaurants, and a large multifamily residential development. In addition, the Willam Pond Recreation Area is directly across High Street, and there is close access to public transportation. Perhaps most importantly, the project is designed for and targeted to meet the housing needs of entry-level workers. The way we plan to structure rents to people, the maximum allowed per unit would be for the, uh, excuse me, except for the one uh, two-bedroom manager's apartment, who are currently earning $16 to $20 an hour, could actually afford to live here. Given current costs associated with land acquisition and construction, with less than 15 units, rents that allow that kind of affordability are simply not possible. Clearly, this proposal does not, may not meet the letter of the zoning provisions for commercial residential district, but it would be difficult to tailor one which better meets the spirit of the ordinance. Okay, all set? All set. All right, well, have you, anyone else want, does anyone want to speak for or against? We have a gentleman here who wants to speak. State your name and address. Good evening. My name is Bill Stowell. I am uh, represent 470 High Street LLC. We're in a better of the project. I just have a couple of comments that I wanted to bring up. Um, I, I want to speak in opposition to this, but I don't want my comments to be misconstrued because I certainly appreciate what Steve is trying to do. Um, over the years, our companies have contributed significantly, both man hours and financially, to the warming shelter and the Stratford County Community Action Program. And I currently work with the Site Selection Committee for the Stratford County Board to be able to look for workforce housing and affordable housing. So it is something that is a, a, of an interest of mine and an interest uh, or an acknowledgement It's something we need to address ourselves. And we're working together to try to do that. Uh, just to read briefly, uh, a couple of things to address on the special exception and then a couple on the uh, variance. Uh, by definition in the zoning requirements or the, in, in the zoning ordinance, the definition of the RC zone, this district is provided to allow the commercial development of transitional areas where there is existing residential use such that the existing residential uses are adequately protected from new non-residential uses. It is not intended for the, uh, it is not the intention of this district to allow for new residential construction. And I would just like to point out that as, as Dana represented earlier, there has been uh, a business site plan that's been approved on the property. So it is, uh, it is a property that is conducive for business development um, if so chosen. A uh, couple of things to point out to do with the variance. Um, I just wanted to comment on a couple of things, Dana. Um, the project is being represented as 34,000 square feet, and I just wanted to point out that that's the entire square footage of the lot, which includes both condominium A and condominium B. So condominium A is already, already has a, a multi-business structure on it and parking. The area that's going to be devoted to this particular project, um, it's probably more in the 17, 18, 19,000 square feet. So it's considered the uh, activity that's, that we're going to try to do here is considerably more <coughs> on the area that's available to build versus the entire 34,000 square foot site. And as far as the density request from, on the applicant, um, on a couple of properties, commercial properties on High Street, um, I'm intimately familiar with the revaluation process that the city is going through and um, where values are going. And I've sat down with the assessor a couple of times and we've talked about land values and um, knowing what my land value on High Street is being valued at um, compared to what the asking price is for this particular property. This property is consider considerably overpriced, and I don't think it's the the function of this board to allow greater density requirements to offset uh, prices that aren't in line with where they should be. So that's the extent of the comments. Thanks for your time. 
Thank you very much. Anyone else like to speak? Sir? Nope. Want to back up, Mr. McKenzie? All right, questions for the applicant. Mr. Jones. Um, you mentioned affordable housing. Love to see that. What percent annual gross income are you shooting for? I'm, I'm shooting for, um, and, and I'm going to, I may be a little bit general on it, but what, we, what we're shooting for is something that um, to not go over, I'm sh I'd like to not go over 25% of, of income. So that, and, and what we calculated out was I, I worked with, with entry level workers, you know, 16, 17, $18 an hour. Two people earning those wages at, actually, well, no one person could. Two people working at those wages could, um, according to most guidelines of what you go to housing, could afford to, to rent those apartments. Um, that, that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're shooting for. And I'm, I've worked with, um, and, and we've looked at a couple ways to do it. We've looked at some conventional financing. I've I'm working with the uh, state of New Hampshire and the New Hampshire Housing Finance Corporation. Um, and it, so that's, that's about the best I can give you at this moment. Okay. Um, let me rephrase my question. Okay. So a AGI is calculated as housing expenses being 30% of the income. Right. So what percent? I want to say that or under. No, I, I understand that. 80% um, mean gross income comes out to a salary of like $80,000 right. uh, for one person. So that's 30% of their housing expenses. That 30% is fixed okay. in the calculation. I so what percent income are you looking for? Because 60% is deeply affordable. 80% is affordable. I'm not even following you. So I'm, I'm not following. That's yeah, how affordable I'm, housing so is. So, but, but we don't understand what you're asking. Well, he said he's providing affordable housing, and I want to know what target are you shooting for? What are target you, of what? Of mean annual income for the area. So how much? How much they're making? How much money? No. Um, so if you are, um, it, sixty percent of the population would be able to afford this if their housing costs are thirty percent of their income. Okay. That's for the. That's for an aggregate average of the area okay i did i did not calculate that way so I, I'm, not, I'm not sure i can answer your question okay <laughs> well it's not affordable if you don't meet those guidelines that's okay. what i'm saying okay but just he's just doing raw numbers so he's not doing yeah yeah for 80 right. percent of the people who live here it's a philosophical yeah it's not philosophical this is how the housing authority does it right but it's well no it's raw data they take everyone's incomes in the area 80 percent of the people can afford this number this rent, that's what I want to know. Is it 80%? Is it 70%? Is it 60%? And, I can, and I'm telling you honestly, I can't answer that question. It's not the way I calculated it. Okay, thank yeah. you. Questions for the applicant? All right, I got a couple questions. Okay, so do you, so in, in this building, do you intend to meet all the zoning requirements besides the one you're asking for a variance? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so it's, we talk about integrity, of the, where the building has the integrity of the neighborhood. It doesn't change integrity of the neighborhood. So my knowledge of that neighborhood is it's predominantly commercial. Correct. So why does adding residential to a, that, that not change the characteristic of the neighborhood? Well, you've got you've got residential out beyond where we are. You've got you've got um, you've got an office building. Then you would have me. Then you have self storage, and then you have a lot of residential. Okay. A lot of residential. I don't know how many hundreds of units um, Flatley has out there, but a lot. Okay. Um, well, we've had a lot of discussion tonight about maintenance, and it's an existing lot. Um, so, do you intend to meet the Summersworth zoning uh, property maintenance requirements? Absolutely. See any issues with that? I do not. Okay. Um, so, having residential within this commercial district, the commercial residential district, is it going to have any negative impact? On the building surround the property surrounding it. I mean, I can't speak to other to other property owners, but but from from my perspective, I don't see that it does anything except enhance. I, I don't I don't see any negative impact uh, in the area whatsoever. I mean, it's not, it's not like we're we're plopping a 15 unit building in the middle of um, a, a single family housing development. Or the, I, I mean, I wouldn't apply to do that. I wouldn't want that. You know, um, so no, I, I see no negative impact at all. It's, it's a very, very highly mixed use area. We talked about how many, so maximum you talked about, so you're, you're allowed five units, 
you want to go for a variance which would allow 15 15 so let's say two people so we're, we're, we're between 10 and and 30 people so how's that how's that going to affect the traffic on is that currently called tri-city road still it is i mean it, again from my perspective i can't i can't see and i and i will admit when it comes to traffic i'm a bit of a lay person but i'm very much of a lay person i can't see that that building that the, the traffic generated by that building would be negligible in comparison to what's already there and using it successfully day in and day out. I mean, I use it. I shop at Market Basket. Um, I, I'm there two or three times a week. I, I mean, I never have trouble uh, getting in and out of Tri-City Road, which is the entrance that I most often use. Okay. So you propose it's residential. So with the residential um, use, does it, is it going to create any hazardous waste or any burden on the city? I, I can't see me. I did talk with um, I did talk with um, the engineering department. Um, they're not, you know, they, they did they did you know, talk some about um, traffic, but they said you know in terms of city water, city sewer, um, that, that, that that would not be a problem, would not be an issue. So this would be on city water, city sewer. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, it's already to the lot. I wouldn't even have to dig in the street. Do you happen to know if the apartments behind it are on city water, city sewer? That's that's something I can talk to. So yeah. you, you, don't, you don't need to know that. That's not yours. So, is it, so we talked about hazardous waste. Any other safety issues that this this could potentially generate? I, I can't see any. In fact, one of the things that attracted me to the the lot, even though as somebody mentioned, it is it is rather high priced. Um, it, it it really is a, an ideal location in many many ways. Unfortunately, it sits in a in a district that doesn't allow the kind of density that we would need. But but in terms of concept, I, I would be hard pressed to find. I think a better lot. I mean, where I wouldn't go in, you know, ticking off neighbors, and because I don't want to do that. I like making friends, not enemies. Um, okay. Other questions, Mr. Brooks. The existing building that sits out on the corner is that going to remain any commercial use, or is it going to be all residential? The, the existing building? Yeah. No, I, well, I have no idea what those those owners um, are, are separate from me. They own condominium unit. I think it's A, and I would be condominium unit B. So, so you're not purchasing that building? No, sir. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Oh, this that's all right. Talking about two buildings, I thought that building was factored into this. Um, so do you know? Would I, it looks like there's one entrance in and out of this off of Tri City Road? Mm -hmm. Is that proposed to be moved at all or would it be staying where it is yeah, it would stay where it is because your building would be towards the back mm -hmm. and you're only constructing one building then. one building with 15 units yes, sir. potentially is mm -hmm. what you're proposing okay i i misunderstood that somehow with the one build wasn't following along closely enough i guess um Thank yeah, you can give me another minute. Um, do we know how many offices are in the other condominium unit that they use that is staying here? Um, can you go to your next comment and then I can look? Sure. So um, you're looking for 15 dwelling units. Our ordinance would require 30 spaces. Where would you propose to fit these parking spaces on this property? Okay, I, we, okay you know what? <laughs> I, I may have misspoke, uh, Mr. Kaiser, because I, I, when you're talking about zoning ordinances, I may, I may not be able to meet all of them. I, and what I, what I will tell you is this. According to the deed, this building is allowed 23 parking spaces. But the, 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 it, it, the condominium docks are, are interestingly worded because technically both of us have use of all of it. Um, so I can tell you this, I would not have 30 parking places. Um, what, what we would be uh, proposing is the 23 uh, spaces that are in the part of the deed ascribed to this building, this, um, this condominium unit are 23. So that would be 1.53 um, parking spaces per unit. I think I calculated that right. Okay, that's my only question. Five. Right, so there's five office units in the in the existing condo unit A. Five there different are offices. Five offices in that building. 
Yes, different. All right, my, my, I'm going to move. I'm going to ask you a question about a variance. So the di most difficult criteria to meet in a variance, and it's across the variance, is criteria three, which is the one that you had a hard time understanding. The layman's instruction of it is: is what is unique to your property such that the ordinance is unfair to you or your property? So that was. That, so I can you. I, and I think part of the answer to that is that it's it's sandwiched in between two other. Types of businesses, um, one an off one a, a um, an office building, one multi storage, um, and so it, it's a it, there's no way to expand that lot. There's no way to make it any bigger. Um, there's no you know it, it's it's just not not possible. So that's about the best I can do on on what makes that lot unique. Bless you. Sorry. Other questions for the applicant? Mr. Brooks. So the, the condo effect of this really complicates things, especially when it comes to variances and special exceptions now. Um, I know we've had a similar business. They all stand alone, but regarding a sign and, you know, when they put up regulations that you put a sign here but then the condo agreement is now sub subletting out or selling off a portion however you want to put it now you need another sign but our zoning doesn't allow that so this gets very complicated um, so if you're purchasing condo B mm -hmm. are you purchasing land too Sort of, yes. or the use it's, of it's, land. It does, yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It's a. It's not. It's not actually unlike buying a, a condominium dwelling unit. Only it's just. It, it's. It's a piece of land. Yeah. But, but there's still there's a there's a there's an association a, a, um, a condo association. Uh, there will be common area charges in terms of maintaining you know parking lot and and that access that kind of thing. I'm I'm familiar with all of that regarding condos it's just it puts us in an odd spot if you will when we have to grant a variance based on a condo situation which hasn't even had the parameters drawn up yet there are condo docks i understand that but you know it, it's one thing when you go in and purchase one you have outlined what you get what you can use what your responsibilities are here we're granting a variance based on what could be built and we don't even know what all these parameters are going to be and we're possibly granting a variance in regard to that it really makes me take a step back and think scratch my head for a minute about how this really plays out in the big scheme of things um, you know, the, 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 I'm trying to figure <laughs> out where that question falls exactly. I got to give it some more thought. Okay, Mr. Fredette. And, and maybe I'm off where Mr. Brooks is going, but I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Brooks, I know that you will, but part of the responsibility of this board is to protect butters and other people in the zone and I think where mr. Brooks is going is how are we able to protect the abutters particularly those who are going to share this parcel without in the event that a project like this is built am I way off mr. Brooks I think there's a lot of moving parts so it's hard to say um, I'm not sure exactly. Again, and, and to Mr. Kaiser's point, and, and I've seen some of your work, Mr. McKenzie, I appreciate the projects you've done. They're all of high caliber, but the issue here really falls in this hardship criteria. Um, and, and we have to look at it, I think, or I always try to look at it as a board member that 
if we grant this for this 0.75 acre parcel, which is really half of that, what's to stop somebody else from coming in and asking on a 0.33 acre parcel or whatever to do essentially the same thing without a defined hardship? Other questions for the applicant? Seeing none, last comments by the applicant. I, I don't really have anything else to add other than um, I live in this city. I've lived in the city since 1989. I'm not going anywhere unless I take the magic bus. Um, and and I, I want, you know, my, again, my objective is to do something good for the city um, to, to help address um, what I see as a, as a major I don't know if it's a crisis that might be overblowing it, but it kind of is um, in, in providing housing for people who in general struggle to afford housing. Um, it, it, you know, is it all altruistic? No, I don't expect to lose money, um, but, I, it, but I, don't, I don't expect to, I, I expect to charge an affordable rent and I, and, I, and I intend to include everything so that people know what their rents are um, I also intend to have really tight leases so that, um, and, and I, don't, I don't know exactly how tight I can get. I, I, I can't say, um, for example, you know, somebody said, are you going to allow kids? Well, I can't say no kids because that would be grossly discriminatory, but I can say no more than two people. Uh, I think I can say things about overnight guests. Um, I, think, I think there's a lot of things I can say without being um, unduly discriminatory because I, I, my objective is, is to not become a slumlord and yet to, to, um, to build housing that is new, that is um, affordable. Okay, thank you very much. With that, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Um, I'm gonna ask that the board consider that when they do regional impact, they consider that the regional impact, even if, if, if both the special exception and the variance is considered, i.e. there is a, how many units was that? Ten, a 50, 15 units were, were in place, would there be any regional impact? Does anyone see any, re Mr. Fredette? Um, I don't see any regional impact for either. Sorry, I don't see regional impact for e <laughs> the um, special exception, nor do I see uh, regional impact for the uh, variance request tonight for Mackenzie Ventures, LLC. I don't see anyone else nodding their thing. So was it, are you making a motion? I move that the variance request and special exception request from McKenzie Ventures, Inc. Um, does not have the potential for regional impact. We have a motion. We have a second by Mr. Perkins. Any discussion on the motion which says that it does not, either case would not have regional impact? Seeing none, raise, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Passes. No regional impact. Discussion. We're going to go first to the special exception. Now... So, discussion on a special exception. Mr. Jones and Mr. Vincent. Um, love the idea that this is an affordable housing project. Um, I think the location is could be better. We're in a pretty dense commercial neighborhood, so I don't think we can really meet uh, the integrity and the character of Criteria 2. With Criteria 3, I have no idea how they're going to meet the parking requirements for such a dense use on the property in addition to the existing offices that are already there. Um, so they would need a very minimum a variance for the parking requirements that we currently have on the books. And then I think those two tie together to not meet Criteria 7 either. So, Ms. Crosley, go ahead. I want to note that it would not be a variance from the parking requirements that would be a waiver from parking because multifamily is multifamily and commercial are regulated under the site plan regulations so therefore okay. they, so they would have to meet the two for you. Um, that is the requirement in the site plan regulations but they could ask for a waiver to allow for less than that um, we have seen that with other multifamily properties but the requirement in the site plan regulations is two per unit yes well i guess the unfortunate part here is i also have to be able to say that the parking and loading and other necessary site improvements currently exist and i can't say they are, they are. it does not look like there's enough space for that number of cars and so this is where we, we come into that issue yeah. um, where 
if it was a variance, if you go by the, the, 15, the 15 units, then it wouldn't. Um, but if you go by the five units, it probably would meet the parking. It would meet the parking requirements, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, that just as a discussion, go ahead, Mr. Brooks. And, That's a good point. and to the point that I was trying to get to earlier with the condo is, if these, if this condo A is allowed 23 parking spaces, I believe the number was. Condo B. Um, what about the ones that condo A already uses? You know, it it really complicates how this is all figured and worked out, and that and that's where as well, let's go to the expert. Let's see what they said. <laughs> I have to imagine the twenty three that are provided because it's limited common area. They're shared. How would, the how would this ha be handled, Ms. Crosley? Is there do you have any free knowledge on how that would be handled? I don't recall specifically about shared parking discussions when it went through the site plan review process when the previous commercial um, use was proposed, how exactly that was done. Um, there so does the commercial property have a requirement for a specific number of parking spaces? Yes, commercial properties do. It's based off of square footage for office uses. It's Is there an existing site plan that dictates how many they have to have? For the office use? Um, Should they? I, I would assume there is. I would assume the condo agreement would incorporate that. So a two-unit condo, and especially pri so. Recently, we've updated our subdivision regulations, which is where condo units are regulated under that purview. Prior to that, if it was less than five, five, I think, condos, it didn't come to the city at all for that sort of approval. So they, we didn't get, we only got it for the purposes of assessing to divide that property unit. So the way that they would break up and delineate for condo units and their condo document documentation was entirely <laughs> upon the private ownership for that um, designations on that part. But for the commercial use of the office building, I need to parse through this history to see about their, if they had the appropriate, what sort of site plan approvals they went for. But um, I think it would be considered with the two uses together. Um, there could be discussion about what when the trap and the applicant could provide for site plan review process when is the parking required for the office use is it primarily during the day will the residential use be there too at the parking how could they coexist and be for a mixed be kind of like a mixed use development situation when considering the parking yep. mr vincent and then we'll go back to mr Jones. thank you mr chairman yeah this is a real complicated type of deal I think we have here however um I just wanted to comment and I might have commented before that surrounding communities um, and um, sometimes I hate to talk about surrounding communities because people go well it's not summer's earth but surrounding communities are definitely gearing down and choking down their lot sizes um, to accommodate more homes because we're running out of space what that matters to this board i don't know i'm just it's just something to think about um and we don't have it in place um maybe it's something to think about down the road but um i had to say it because surrounding communities are doing it yep mr jones um, mr. For that. I'd like to just revise my previous statement i given that the parking requirement for the special exception would only be 10 spaces it may have sufficient Parking to meet criteria three. I still don't think it meets criteria two, though. Okay, Mr. Fredette? Um, I agree. I don't think this meets criteria two. This is a new construction. This isn't an existing. This is a new construction vacant lot. We're not trying to make anything existing work here. Um, the most sensible, albeit frustrating, maybe for the process, is some sort of commercial development here. Spencer? Um, however, um, if the building is built in a way that it, uh, that it accommodates built vehicle traffic under it, what, 
which is not far fetched. That that because that I see a building in Dover that's like that, the old hotel. That would accommodate then the parking. If the square footage um, of the building, now you'd include that as the parking lot again. That's just something to think about because the construction of that could possibly, um, and we could do the math here right now, if you have the building size. Do we have the building size? Uh, 45 by 100, 4,500 square feet. 4,500 square feet. So you'd have 4,500 square feet of more parking under the building. And it's not far-fetched, and it's not a laughable thing because it is, a, it, is a, it is something that can be accommodated. Just some thoughts for the board. Board is pondering, and I understand that. It's not to, not to look at. There are parking issues. Hey, Mr. Brooks. So I guess it's fair to say it does meet a few of these, but not all of them from the initial discussion we've had here. Um, Basically, if it can't meet all seven, we don't have to grant it. Correct. We don't have to. We can't grant it, as we yeah, were so can't, true. kindly reminded. Yes. Um. So what I'd like to do is go through the, each criteria, and we'll discuss it to come up with our conclusion. Fair enough. You know, so we can move. So the first criteria is does it meet all the requirements of the ordinance. They, 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 they said the uh, applicant said they would meet... Um, the zoning requirements, Ms. Crosley, as you know, so it, you have to be careful how we discuss this. Is there any zoning requirements that it wouldn't meet either A, with a five units, or B, with a 15 unit? Well, it would just be the use, not the number of units, right? Because that's the variance request. Well, I, I agree with you, but if you're looking at the, if the use, if, we kind of have to look at it dual-wise. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I agree with you. It should really be only the use, but how do you know how many parking spaces are needed if you don't know how many units are there? It, it's it's what comes first. I, I fully agree with you. So that it it speaks to this ordinance for the special exception criteria. So for this ordinance being the zoning ordinance, yep. um, as a five unit, four to five unit density wise, that would meet. That would be meeting density requirements. It is allowed to be built within the setback due to a historic variance that was granted. Um, so there's that aspect of it, but there's the relief for it. And with if the variance was granted for the 15, is that how you want me to answer that? Either part? way, whichever way works best for you. Okay. Obviously, 15 units is not meeting the density requirements, so it would need the relief, relief. the variance relief, which is being sought. Okay. Ms. Jones. So I think decoupling these for the purposes of argument, um, we have to like address the criteria specifically for the use, ignoring the density. And then the question I think before us is, is this an appropriate location for an apartment structure? Well, we gotta get to number two. We're still in number one. Right. Which we'll get to in a moment. Okay, sorry. As long as I'm everyone's all set with one, then we'll move to two. Yeah. Anyone, anyone have any further comments on number one? Yeah. Okay, number two, Mr. Jones. You want me to say it again? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I think decoupling the density from the use is this a uh, you know an appropriate location for an apartment structure, given that it's you know adjacent to heavily commercial uses and behind an existing office building, um, and I I think the answer to that may be no. Okay. For the other comments, sorry, Mr. Perkins. So I disagree with Mr. Jones. I think there's hundreds of apartments right behind it. Um, I do think it meets the criteria too. Okay. Um, I, I guess it's worth noting that the apartments that are behind it are very behind it. They're not immediately on High Street. I mean, this is on High Street. Oh, it's, it's certainly, it certainly it depends how big you draw your circle. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. For if you sure. Draw your, I mean, you know, if you circle 100 feet or 1,000 feet, absolutely. It depends on how big you draw yeah, your, exactly. your circle. If you're looking, at, you're looking at the overhead map, yes, all the abutting properties are commercial, the car, car repair, storage behind it, market basket, and Aspen Dental, I think it is. Aspen it's Dental. surrounded it's on surrounded. all sides by commercial uses. Right. But there is some apartment complexes in the area. Okay. Yeah. Uh, number three would be utilities, drainage, access, parking. 
comments on that criteria? Does it meet it or doesn't it? Mr. Fredette. Even at five units, looking at the size and shape of this lot, I would have at the special exception level serious concerns about the access. Can you expound upon that? Well, you're going to move at least. I mean, it sounds like according to the applicant, he's going to want two people per apartment. So you're going to put a minimum even at five of 10 cars in this lot. And we're not really fully clear on the parking scenario. Um, and access for the offices, people that are coming in, I think it's going to create a bottleneck in the parking area. Okay, Mr. Jones? I mean, even, even the parking aside, if we put a structure in the front that already exists and then a structure in the back and the parking in between, and, you know, even parking under the building, the entirety of the parcel will be impervious cover. I don't even see how it can improve drainage. Uh, where, where are we going to put that? Um, so I, I don't, even for that, I, I don't think that we can get the drainage on here. I mean, maybe there is some, you know, innovative ways ways to do it, but even that is a stretch, as Mr. Fredette put on with the access. And, uh, okay, Mr. Brooks. And <clears throat> the entrance ends up right in the middle. It almost seems like if the entrance was at either end, you might facilitate more parking. So, you know, this is much different than the last one we just had where everything exists, you can see it works. Here we're looking at this and it's hard to visualize how it works. Um, you know, I, I guess we should have asked before, but you know, is this gonna be 100 feet running perpendicular or parallel to Tri-City Road? Because that changes the shape of this lot significantly. I'm guessing it has to run parallel to it to be able to get your setbacks. Which it has an existing waiver for it can be within existing variance for the setbacks. This, which is the re the side setback, it has two fronts on the property. Yeah, two fronts and two sides. Two fronts, two sides. The variance is to permit it to be one side setback would be from two to 15 feet from the property line. Was what, how what's was the front proposed. setback in this area? Residential use is 30s on all sides, which is 30 is consistent with the side setback so, for commercial development. So this well. would have to sit parallel with Tri-City to meet that setback because it's only 115. Unless further variances were sought. Yeah, so, so that, that's even going to crowd this parking more so. Um, you know, I, I guess for me, you know, for me to start to have a clearer picture and say that this meets some of this stuff, I think I would need to see some better, some at least preliminary plans to wrap my head around this better. Mr. Perkins, Mr. Fredette, and then Mr. Vincent. I think right now we're only looking at the special exemption. <clears throat> so the building for five units isn't going to be 100 feet wide. So that should be different. If it's only for five, it's not going to be that big. And this is true too. Mr. Verdep? Okay, Mr. Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, you know, the mouse is on a track in this head here of mine. Um, I come up with some pretty crazy things sometimes, but. Um, what happens if, uh, what are the provisions, so to speak, or what is in the ordinance or whatever it may be? There's a big parking lot there at Market Basket. What happens if the applicant gets permission from people who own Market Basket to park vehicles right there on the other side of the road and they park there? What, what, is the, what do we say about that in our ordinances? Um, the site plan regulations does encourage shared parking areas. They would need still a waiver from the on-site parking requirements of providing two, but they could, as so we have seen in other instances for, in particular, multifamily developments where they come to the planning board seeking a waiver from their on-site parking requirements, and as information with that waiver, they provide parking alternate parking options, such as easements with different properties. So, so it's, that so, would be dependent if the 
corporation that owns the Tri-City Plaza. Would so it's own. not far-fetched that that could happen? That is depending upon a lot of no, we've seen private negotiations. We've seen it in the past. Twice. Okay, twice. so twice, twice, um, so that's something that the board has to take into consideration because if Mr. McKenzie gets a 50-year lease on parking, am I right or am I wrong? That's something the planning board actually has to take. Well, we have to, but the planning board is really the one that rules on it. Okay. It's, it's and again, that's where we're the zone we're in. Further discussion on item three. Item four is adverse effect on nearby properties, noise, glare, and odor. Anybody see any? Mr. Brooks? I, I don't think that a typical residential unit would cause undue noise, glare, or odor. That's... Yeah, you know, again, I think that's geared more towards a industrial use. Yep. I would agree. And, and a zoning, you know, as far as glare goes for lighting already speaks to that. All right. Any other discussion on that? Uh, item five was pedestrian vehicle access into the site, and will it cause any issues on neighboring streets? Mr. Pradat. We've touched on this, but... I do have substantial concerns about pedestrian and vehicle access on this site. I actually, I, I actually have no concern about traffic. I mean, Tri City Road and the apartments back there generate numerous traffic. This is going to be this would be minute uh, compared to that. A simple entrance and exit off this site, I don't see an issue with it. I'm sorry, I thought it was asking about within the site. I apologize. No, oh, that's all right. Anything, any other comment on that one? Moving on to number six, undue burn to any municipal services. I think he, talk, he said he talked to the city engineer. Um, I don't think 15 unit, my opinion, 15 units compared to the 200 or 300 that are behind it. Um, this is on city water, city sewer. I assume the one, the big apartments are on city water, sewer, su city sewer, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, I don't, I think the city, I don't think it would have any effect on the city's utility systems, power, utility, water. Any comments? Seeing none, we'll move on. I'm not trying to rush you, but if you have a comment, please. Um, explain how there will be any significant adverse impacts for uh, public health, safety, and general welfare, welfare. I'm not seeing an impact on any public health, safety, or general welfare to having residential units in that location. Um, does anyone see any issues with that? So I see the board was having issues with number two and number three. Would that be correct? Yes. So I have a question. Yes, Mr. So, you know, because this is such a kind of, I think in my mind, since I've been on the board, a kind of a really unique type of situation. I don't know if any of you would agree. Um, is it is it possible at this point that the applicant, we do a continuation. Is that a possibility that we do a continuation so the applicant might be able to get the answers for, for the for the two criteria, try criteria, or is it that we're past that now? We, that certainly can happen, though I'm not sure what. And for, certainly for number three, traffic parking, they could come up with something. I'm not sure for number two what the applicant could provide, but maybe you could. To impair the integrity or character of the district. Maybe we should ask the applicant if he wants to continue or just take the answer now. It's up to us, not up to him. It's up to us. Oh, it's up to us. Okay. It's up to us. We have to make that decision. Mr. Fredette. I'm going to err on the side. Again, unfortunately, I think this is a laudable project. I think it's a needed project, and I think it's a great concept. I just think, unfortunately, this is the wrong place with the wrong circumstances with the character of this particular immediate area and honestly I think it would put undue financial strain on the applicant to do further fact-finding in my opinion Mr. Brooks then Mr. Vincent <clears throat> um, I'm almost at the point where I want to say yes to most of these, but there's just that little bit of unknown what if here that right. really is just eating at me on it that says I can't be 100% sure that it does meet these. Um, you know, 
sitting on other boards I and commissions here in the <laughs> town. I know that we're looking at zoning and trying to make stuff more friendly for something like this. You know, obviously that's not what's now, but I, you're right. Other cities have done it, and yeah. and we need to do it, and we know we need to do it, and we're trying to do it. We got Just nothing yet. happens fast enough. Right. Um, you know, could this be allowed then? Maybe. Does he want to wait then? Probably not. Um, but the character alone, I don't know if that's, an, that's enough for me to say no to this. I guess I'm more concerned with the adequate parking and traffic end of it. Um, it just, you know, maybe there's ways to solve that, but there's a lot of, still a lot of unknowns <laughs> with this whole thing because it's so complicated having special exception variance. Quick question about the special exception. Does it go away after two years, like variances, if it's not used? Yes. Okay. So do you, is there, is if, would more, could you, do you feel you need more information to make a decision? There's certainly room for more information here. It certainly would help. <laughs> we, can t we can continue it to the next meeting. Would that would, get you to criteria two? We could allow the applica applicant to provide um, additional information to show that it would, would or would not support criteria two. We could give it, we put okay. the bur we put the burden on the applicant <laughs> to do that, provide us provide that information, and then we can come to decision, and then we can come to decision. And and just a point of order, it's it's almost ten thirty as it is, <laughs> so we're supposed to adjourn by ten thirty. Is that correct? Even if we're in the middle of something, you can waive your rules. The, it's only a rule. Or, or we could simply adjourn by 10, allowing this to be continued, literally, <laughs> well, because yeah. we're halfway through it, right? No, it doesn't help, but it might. It doesn't help because we, it, we, if, if we continue it, we need to, the applicant to give us information. Right. Yeah. So we need to do it that way <coughs> versus just letting it lay on the table. Mr. Vincent. So uh, the reason why I'm being so adamant about this is because, yeah, there is such a need uh, and at the city level for affordable housing, n no doubt about it. Um, and um, I think to continue it um, would allow the applicant because when you come, you know, when you come before these boards and we put out all this information, you know, an applicant is like, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, you're a little overwhelmed sometimes. So by knowing what the applicant has heard, he might be able to adjust some of these things to make things work because it is such a complicated thing. So, I mean, I'm up for making a motion to continue with the time, the, all the complicity of this. I'm making a motion that we continue uh, for the next meeting. So we have to go through the form. You have to have the right words, and we also need to say we have to make sure we continue it till uh, November six. November six. Yeah, we're all that. And, and it's for the applicant <laughs> to provide additional information on the scope, but basically the scope of the project. Yeah. Scope of the project, including or including parking. Um, any, anything for the scope of the project? And number two, we got to Oh, um, no, I was going to say yep. something. Um, if the project is truly affordable, I want to work with that, but I have no evidence that it is, except for a claim. But how does that get into the cri five criteria for <clears throat> a special exception or a um, variance? General welfare of the neighborhood, it's kind of loose. Uh, it, it, I just, I feel like if it's affordable, that should be on the table, but you're right, it's not a criteria. More information on how it meets. Quite, uh, what, what, what's the, does not is is not, does not impair the integrity of the neighborhood. Does not, how it does not. I don't want to just say criteria too. Please include in the motion the variance application too, if that's the intent to continue. No, that. the variance application was not gotten to. But you did open the public hearing on it, so. Did open a public hearing. Okay. Just wanting to make sure that that is also, and you're not making a decision on it tonight. That's so, correct. So that it doesn't have to be renoticed. That you make sure to continue okay. that to the next meeting as well, so keep that public hearing. So going. that'd be that's two exactly motions. That's exactly my motion. We do one motion or two motions. <laughs> Um, I think we could do one motion as long as it's 
specifically said that you're continuing the special exception application of McKenzie Ventures and the variance application, and then for the reasons for the additional information that you're looking for the applicant to supply, and then being to the November 6th meeting. That was exactly my thoughts. <laughs> All right. Excellent. I'll make a motion. I'm going to make a motion. After review of the application to file <laughs> all information presented to the board, I feel that this uh, additional information is needed. The additional information is needed from the applicant on the scope of the project, including parking, and more info and on how it meets how it how it will not impair impair the character of the district. Okay, character of the neighborhood. I like that sports better. Character of the neighborhood. Of the so, you'll it. Well, you don't, you don't write this to make this thick. You very rarely continue things. No. So you're you need additional information, which you've stated in the applications of of the special special exception and variance have not. No, can't get rid of those words. Be continued to the. Be continued until November sixth, twenty twenty four. Special exception from table four. You want both units and property. So we get it. Oh, you're killing me here. You could say special exception application of McKenzie Venture. Special exception and variance applications, applications of McKenzie submitted by. Ventures. Yep. He continued November 6th. And I will withdraw my motion and second it. Yay. So I made a motion, second by Mr. Vincent. Discussion on the motion. The motion is to continue it until November 6th so the applicant provide us more information. Discussion? All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Motion passes 5-0. All right, it's almost 10.30, so there's only one thing I can hope for. A motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. Mr. Redette, second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. It doesn't want my report. No, 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 no business. I don't want you to think no business. No new business. You're right, you're right, it's new business. I thought about that. I sat here and thought about it, but I forgot about it.